the October edition of the Exeter's Conservation Commission. Um, I am going to read, before I do anything else, we're going to read the preamble to today's meeting. Good evening. As chairman of the Conservation Commission, I am declaring that an emergency exists, and I am invoking the provisions of RSA 91A2 3B. Federal, state, and local officials have determined that gatherings of 10 or more people pose a substantial risk to our community and in its continuing efforts to combat the spread of COVID-19. In concurring with their determination, I, am also, I also find that this meeting is imperative to the continued operation of town government and services, which are vital to public safety, safety and confidence during this emergency. As such, this meeting will be conducted without a quorum of this body physically present in the same location. At this time, I also welcome members of the public accessing this meeting remotely. Uh, even though this meeting is being conducted in a unique manner under unusual circumstances, the usual rules of conduct and decorum apply. Thank you for your patience for this process. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance of the Conservation Commission members. Um, when each member states their name, also please state whether there's anyone in the room with you during the meeting. So why don't I read over the names and you can you can weigh in when I read your name, okay? Carlos? Present, and I'm by myself in the room. Trevor? Present and alone in the room. Bill? I'm present and alone with any two-legged people. I might have a four-legged one behind me. All right. Dave, short. Uh, present and lonely. Yeah. Allison. Allison Everhart, currently alone, may have a kid or two pass through. Drew. Andrew Koff, um, alone. And I'm Sally Ward, and I'm alone at the moment. Nick. I am present and currently alone. Kristen. Osterwood. I am present and I am not alone. Children and spouse. And Ginny. Ginny, are you with us? I thought I saw her. She's Ginny? muted. Ginny, you're muted. <clears throat> there you go. I'm an, I am alone. And John? Uh, I have a member of the family who will be in and out, but for the most part, I'll be alone. Julie Gilman, are you with us tonight? I don't see Julie. Hmm. And Kristen Murphy. Kristen Murphy, I am present and alone in the room. Did I miss anyone? Okay, we're good to go. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and thanks to the um, applicants who are, we'll get to shortly, um, who, who are also signed on to this meeting. Uh, are there any, before we get to our action items, are there any public comment for items not already on the agenda? <laughs> if not, I will move on to the first action item um, that is with Ben Excuse and me, Sarah. Sir. Yep. Um, Rebecca Moore has her hand up. Rebecca Moore has her hand up. Rebecca Moore, can you unmute? Yes, I can. <clears throat> Undo that. That's okay. We don't see your video, but I can hear you. Okay. That Good evening. My name, as you know, is Rebecca Moore. Thank you for the opportunity to address the commission during this time for public comment. I speak for four of the property owning households on Nelson Drive in Exeter. As neighbors and abutters to lot 8356, we would like to voice publicly our appreciation for the commission's previous consideration of our concerns about the proposed building on that lot. Because of your recommendation at last month's meeting, construction has begun on only one of the two proposed buildings, while the wetlands and buffer zones have been left as they were at the time of your last meeting. 
just for records in the future, as residents, we would like to have access to a copy of your recommendation to the planning board on the matter of lot 8356. Going forward, we'd also like to know about plans to restore in early January, 2020. This tree removal happened before the lot 8356 owner was made aware by the town of the need for a conditional use permit for potential building in those buffer zones. Whose responsibility is it now to restore those trees, we wonder? The towns, the lot 8356 owners, out of our neighborhood interest in the effective buffer environment, we could see supporting some of the cost of those replacement trees. We would appreciate your direction on this matter. Once again, on behalf of our households, thank you for your work to preserve the town's environmental resources. Marshall and Rebecca Moore, Kathleen McDonnell and Andrew Swinnerton, Stephanie Marshall and James Breeling, Dawn Jelly and Eric Downer. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for that comment. It's good to hear the follow-up on the update on that. That it's always good to hear. Um, do we, I don't know if we can address your comment regarding the, the tree cutting at this moment, unless Kristen Murphy, do you want to, or, or we can at least follow up with you, certainly provide you the correspondence or letter that we provided to the planning board, that's not a problem. Um, Kristen, do you have any comments at this moment or would, would you like some time to review the, the comment? Um, yeah, I guess I, this would be a little unusual um, in terms of how that would move forward. So I'm not quite sure how to advise you. My assumption would be um, that would, that you would, the conservation commission would need to send a letter to the code enforcement officer, which would be Doug Eastman. Um, typically when we have buffer violations, um, it's up to, uh, you know, there's a little discretion on how they're managed. Sometimes just allowing them to naturally revegetate is sufficient. And that's generally the, pro the approach that's taken when there isn't, you know, some runoff or some signs of erosion or things of that nature. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, obviously, I did not see it before it was cut, so I don't know the degree of cut. I have heard the presentation from the property owner. I've also heard the presentation from the abutters, and they seem to differ a little bit. Um, I don't know whether they were native or invasive. I know some trees were cut. Uh, they were all outside of the wetland areas, um, but they were within buffer areas. So uh, long story short, I really don't know the best way to advise. Yeah, that was also my reaction. I wasn't sure the exact best way. Um, maybe you could submit, Rebecca, if you could submit, if you have that letter written, you could submit it to us um, as well. And we can go from there. Thank you for your comment. Unless, Rebecca, you have further comments, um, we'll move, move on to the first item. Okay, um, the first item is a request for a tree removal of all things, funny timing, um, on the Rains Farm property. Uh, we have Ben and Sarah Anderson on the line to discuss this matter. Do you wanna talk about it uh, briefly? Yeah, I'd be happy to give a, a brief uh, overview because I know you have a full agenda, but essentially what what happened is uh, with uh, COVID and the pandemic, like everyone else, we were shut down in mid-March uh, and closed for nearly four months until the, the nice weather uh, moved in. And then with the town's approval, we moved our uh, music and literary events into our back fields, uh, created a, a distanced, massed, open air gathering space. Uh, for people to uh, enjoy, uh, but the challenge that we faced was that uh, that area uh, was formally used to park some vehicles. Uh, so essentially what we did is we split 
the parking into two and used our lower field, uh, which we hadn't used before, uh, to park cars and uh, used uh, an old uh, cattle tractor uh, con- uh, crossing road between the lower field and the rains field as an access point, uh, which ended up working out beautifully. It, it turned out to be a much safer uh, entry point than our uh, driveway on the corner uh and just made everything safer and easier uh for patrons uh but uh in the end uh dot uh took a look at it and uh to make sure that everything was safe and determined that everything was good except for one lone tree uh that interfered uh with part of the the sight line clearance that was necessary uh for them to grant approval and that tree uh, resides on the Rains farm side of uh, the road. Uh, and DOT said it's right on the border of whether it's their tree or Rains. Uh, so they, they opted to uh, defer that it belonged to Rains and that we would need uh, permission from the Rains farm in order to, to remove it. It is, uh, like I said, right on the border of the road. Uh, it has no habitat value. Uh, it's currently overshadowing uh, a, a pair of sugar maples uh, behind it. Uh, and it's also, it's been struck. You can see the scarring on the trunk numerous times by uh, the snow plow. Um, so its removal would not only allow us to, to, uh, to use the safer uh, parking area for our community gathering events, uh, but also would uh, provide a much safer uh, sight line for general travel uh, along the road. Um, also, I, I should also mention that uh, this was brought forward to the Rains Farm Stewardship Committee, who reviewed it and took a look at it uh, and uh, approved it. Uh, and ultimately, we're here for, for your blessing. Um, so I can provide more detail if you like, but that's sort of it in a nutshell. I think that was great um, level of detail. Thank you, Ben. Um, I've looked at the tree on, on Google Earth, and actually I have it here. If I could share it, I don't know if anyone wants to see the tree in question. Okay, let's see. I brought it up. Technology. Let's see if this works. Or can you see? There we go. Yeah. So it's this tree by the road. That's there's a sort of a forked. Yep. Is it a maple? It's an American elm. Oh, it's an elm. Okay, there's it's an American elm. There. That's. You see the the sugar maple behind it that it's overshadowing. This one. So we're just talking about this this right here. Yep. Okay. And it does overhang the road a bit, anyways, and this power line. So if I could, this is Sally, could I chime in from Rain's Farm Stewardship? Yes. So we did discuss it. Uh, we didn't take a formal vote because I wanted, we, we thought people should have a chance to see the, the tree in person. Um, asked folks if they wanted to have a special meeting to take a vote. I'd heard no objections. And... Um, so we we uh, we didn't take a formal vote, but there were no objections. And um, I did ask Jay Perkins, who is the town uh, tree warden, to take a look at it. And I would like to give you um, his comments. So uh, he says, I looked at the elm tree and I think it would be a good idea to remove it. It would give the sugar maples much needed sun so they will thrive. And where the elm is so close to the road, it will really struggle with road salt as it grows. It's not in the best of shape now with its multiple stems. Hope this helps. And that's uh, Jay's feedback, which I found valuable. Thank you. That's, that's good information. So to enhance these two trees and protect the safety of, of people pulling out onto the road does seem to make sense. A question, Andrew? Done. So this is on the south, as far as the south side of the barn. Yes. This is the, okay. So. Okay, I'll turn around. There's the barn. Okay, cool. So there's so, the, the, well, the well house. Yep. So as Mr. Anderson explained, this was to give safer access to parking in the Rains property? No, parking on, parking on our property. 
Okay, okay, that's okay, on your property. Yes. But on okay. the other side of the road. Right, uh, yeah, on the, uh, as I look at the, at the Google, it's on the right-hand side. <laughs> okay, that's where I was confused from the, from the description, I think, in the, uh, in the packet that talked about, I, I thought I read, removing the elm would make a safer access for, for parking on the range property, because that's not where our parking area is. Our parking's are past the, uh, past the barn, not the not end of the property. Am I correct? Correct. Correct. There is a, there is an active road there. It's not for, for the rains parking area, but it is used. And so it, it would, it will increase the safety of taking equipment in and out of, uh, of that road. Well, that's really a turnoff. It's really not a road. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a bad corner of to, to, to have cars access in there, I think. Yeah. That's not the parking area. Okay. Right. Okay. That, that's what I was trying to clear up. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing because I don't, don't think we need that anymore. Well, I hate to see an American Elm get cut, but I will make a motion that we approve the uh, cutting of the uh, the tree. I, I, I think it, uh, I, again, I, don't, I was out there and I looked from, uh, it seems to me you can see right around the tree, but I won't try and fight DOT either. So I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the removal of that tree. And Ben, are you going to take care of that? Is that? Yes, that'll be at my expense, our expense. Yeah. A second. Okay. Any other comments? Let's do a roll call vote. Okay. Carlos. Aye. Trevor. Aye. Bill. Yes. Dave? Yes. Allison? Aye. Drew? <laughs> yes. Sally votes yay and Ginny. Ginny? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Have a good night. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Up next, we have the Shoreland Conditional Use Permit application for Phillips Exeter Academy for repairs to the Hill Bridge, enhancing scour resistance, um, repairing the riverbank erosion and minor landscaping at the ends of the bridge. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, before you get going, I, I need to recuse myself on this one uh, as a, a butter to the property and also as a former employee of the uh, property, so, I mean, of the company. So I'm going to recuse myself from voting. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, I guess I, before we get going, I guess I'll just note that there's sort of three things we're deciding on tonight. There's the shoreland conditional use permit. Um, and then we are also making recommendations on the state wetland expedited application and the state shoreline permit. We are not doing our own wetland conditional use permit because it was not needed at this area. Um, so I guess with that in mind, we can turn it over for a presentation from Phillips Exeter. Um, James Turner, are you presenting or someone else? Uh, I am. Um, my name is Jim Turner from Stevens Associates Consulting Engineers. Um, Mark Mark Layton was on a minute ago. I don't I don't yes, see him. He's on still. So. Yeah, I'm here, Jim. Oh, okay, I, I lost yeah. you. I know you wanted to say something to begin. Yeah, no, that's okay. I was just going to do the quick introduction and just some some background on the project. But uh, so I'm Mark Layton, Director of Facilities. I was just here a few weeks ago, I believe, or maybe three weeks ago. So it's good to see everybody again. Um, I have a colleague with me tonight from, from PA, Ron Johnson, who's our senior manager for grounds and athletics. And then you just met uh, Jim Turner from Stevens Associates. And I'm not sure if Bob, if Bob Stevens is on too from Stevens Associates, but uh, we hired Stevens Associates to help us with this project. 
Um, I, hopefully, many of you are aware of Hill Bridge. It's you know it's a pretty beautiful bridge that crosses Exeter River on our campus, uh, built in 1914, and so it's a little over 100 years old and needs some TLC. And so we hired Stevens Associates to help us with that, and and uh, which is why we're here tonight. And and uh, Jim can walk through the oh there's a, there's the picture right there. So it's. Uh, it was actually donated by a uh, gentleman, George Hill, from the class of 1865. So, and like, like I said, opened up in 1914. So the, um, what we're hoping to, to accomplish um, with this project is some, some maintenance that you can see some smalling and some strengthening of the bridge and erosion control around the sides. It's, um, it had started a, long, a while ago where there was access by some pet owners would go have their dogs go down into the river and it's definitely eroded in certain sections. So if you've walked across there, you'll notice on the south side, there's quite a bit of erosion that we want to address and then also do some improvements to the access um, by pedestrian and some vehicle access that we feel like is, is um, going to help for the use of the, of the bridge in the long term. But um, so we're, we actually tried to do this project back in 2014 and just didn't have the funding in place. So we're trying again and hopefully we can, we can have the funding for next summer to do this. Um, but uh, so we just wanted to give the background and, and why we feel like we, uh, it's important for us to do the project and um, hope that it's here for another hundred years. And with that, I'll just hand over to Jim to, to talk through the, uh, the details of the project. I think I think Mark hit um, a lot of the, the really good uh, points there. The the project is is really three components. It's um, structural repairs of the bridge to the concrete surfaces. It's a repair of um, bank erosion with biostabilization methods, and it's going to add some um, some scour resistance around the uh, abutment footings of the bridge. Um, so there'll be a, a bit of riprap uh, to go in around the, the bridge uh, ends there. Um, so just briefly, Mark uh, hit on some of the, the uh, erosion that's taken place. And I'll just scroll. These, these are our photographs from our wetland uh, permit application. Um, you can see some erosion in the top photo uh, of the bank in, the, in there. Um, there's some erosion in the bottom photo here, um, in large part from pedestrian access. There's some call outs for existing stone riprap, which there really isn't much left of. Um, historically, there was riprap um, around the ends of the bridge. Um, and so some of the, um, some of the repairs here is, are going to um, place some of that. Here's a historic photo that shows um, how some of that riprap used to be look. Um, but most of that is not, not there anymore. So um, we're looking at temporary impacts um, for cofferdams. Um, those uh, cofferdams would be to um, do the work around the abutments in the dry uh, to, to excavate out some of the material that is at the, at the abutment and uh, replace it with riprap. Um, the contractor is required to maintain river flow, normal river flow uh, while they're doing that work. Um, the permanent impacts that we are um, permitting are for the, um, the bank stabilization predominantly um, and the, the landscaping improvements that would be on the bank as well. Um, the project's been reviewed by New Hampshire Fish and Game uh, and Natural Heritage Bureau. Um, neither one has uh, taken any exceptions to or identified endangered species that they're concerned about, um, and they've both uh, given their, their response. Uh, as far as timing goes, uh, Mark had uh, indicated the project's intended to be constructed next summer. Um, so predominantly when, when flows are typically in a lower time of year. Um, we're applying for, as, as uh, I think was mentioned at the beginning, the permits in question here are the state wetlands uh, application. It's a minimum impact expedited application uh, and a state shoreland application, and then the local uh, conditional use permit. Um, so what we're, we're here to look for is for the commission to, um, to be able to sign the state wetland permit uh, application before we submit it to the state and then to um, complete its review for the, the uh, local shoreland permit application. Um, and with that, uh, we'll take any questions. 
Do you want to show any pictures of the, the finished design um, for folks? I, I know you've shown the existing condition in this historical photo, but I know yeah. in our packet there was some changes to the impervious cover, I believe, and sure. some changes. Sure, I, I can show some plans. I don't have photographs. Yeah, that's, sorry, that's what I mean, plans. So this is, this is the, a landscaping plan. Um, see if I can walk you through it here. So this is the, the existing uh, dirt road leading up to the bridge. Um, the size of that is actually going to shrink some. Um, this is on the southwest uh, side of the bridge. There's an existing walkway um, in this area here where my cursor is. And you can kind of see in the faint background here, the area that is really all um, uh, bare soil at this time, um, that will all be vegetated and these, uh, these pathways um, better defined. Um, and the south here of the bridge abutment is one of those areas of the bank stabilization. Um, where where uh, kids and other folks have previously come down to the river. Um, the, the bridge surface gets uh, replaced. Uh, and then on the, the northeast side here by the athletic fields, um, similarly, there was a, um, a footpath that used to go, that goes along the bank. Um, and that is, is going to be more um, stabilized for uh, a, a better access and less erosion. Uh, the bank erosion here uh, is going to be repaired. That's one of the ones we saw in the photographs. And then the riprap um, that's going uh, under the bridge and around the sides is right around the abutments um, shown, shown here. These outlines, there's some faint outlines here. These would be the temporary coffer dams um, on this side and then one on this side that would allow the contractor to do this work in the dry. Um, the planting, there's a planting plan as well um, to once all this work is done to replant the, um, the bank here with uh, some um, uh, grasses, trees, and shrubs. How does the, how does the water get managed that gets pumped out of the coffer dams? Just curious. Um, the, the contractor will need to set up a, um, a, uh, a filtering system. So they usually use those um, dewatering bags most commonly. Um, so they would need to um, pump out the water once they, once they construct the coffer dam, they would need to pump it out to one of those erosion control uh, systems. I didn't see a list, Jim, in the, uh, James, in the uh, thing of what kind of plantings you're gonna be putting there. Are they sure. native plants? Um, let me scroll down here to the planting plan. Oh, I missed it. Um, I, I hadn't displayed it yet, so I was just pulling oh. it up. Um, so they have some, um, some silky dogwood, a red twig dogwood, spice bush, um, some perennial, uh, some ferns, some uh, New England aster, um, and then um, some various seed mixes for, for lawns and grasses. Does anyone have any general project questions like this? Any other questions? Yeah. You, oh, you're not okay. widening the bridge at all. We are not widening the bridge. The structural repairs are, are concrete surface repairs. Um, so they're going to be repairing cracks. They're going to be um, repairing spalls. Um, the, the roadway over the bridge will be removed and there will be some um, concrete repairs on the inside uh, under the road, inside of the, the walls of the bridge there. Um, and then the road will be put back. But the structure, the bridge is going to remain the same size um, and the same configuration. Good. So this is a this is a bridge repair project under the wetland regulations, and um, a, a really a safety improvement project as well to keep that the bridge maintained um, and safe passage across the river um, for pedestrians as well as if it, if it had to be used in an emergency. Um, and then of course the the bank repair is a um, a beneficial um, biostabilization, and then um, again the the rip wrap repairs to to maintain those abutments.
I, I had a question about the um, this this the seeds that would be used in the planting. Mm -hmm. I believe it was this project. Wasn't there a comment by one of the um, one of the people who'd analyzed this that they wanted a particular seed to be removed from the mix? Am I getting this correct? That's correct, and um, that that change has been implemented. Okay, thank you. Yep, we. What, what, uh, I don't remember the specific mix that they were looking for, but um, we had once we received the comment, we had um, reached out to the landscape architect, and they had agreed that um, that to use this the seed that was requested or the mix. Allison has her hand up. Oh, yeah. thank you. Uh, a couple questions. Um, so. First of all, I don't live too far from here. Um, prior to the trail system being closed, I would say that I was over there fairly frequently, particularly with the proximity of your dog park there. I would say that um, it, was, it would be uncommon to not see someone with a dog accessing the river particularly from the upstream bank, but also from the downstream bank where you have a bit of a um, steeper slope to get down. And I think that's just a very common thing. I think that, you know, certainly a bank restoration and stabilization project, I am all for, but I do think it's worth your while to consider public access because people are going to do it. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you've considered that, particularly because I do think this is a prime access point because there's not much between, you know, the boat launch and Gilman Park. I think this is kind of the midpoint access. I've seen people get in and out of their kayaks here and, you know, launch their canoes here. And so, um, you know, we'd hope that people would... Uh, respect a restoration project, but I also know just from my own experiences that planting some small shrubs, laying down some seeds, and even putting up signs don't prevent people. Behavior is very hard to change. So have you given any thought to accommodating people's use of this area? Jim, I can speak to that. Um, so we did at the beginning, and we actually a few years ago, um, put up some temporary fencing to, to keep people from using that area because the erosion was so bad. There's actually an area a little bit to the west. I don't think it's on these on these documents that is already intended for like it's a it's kind of an informal boat launch that that um, that really should be used for any of that. Um, and so I, I think when we uh, I know when we talked about this, we really don't want to, to continue or, or allow use of this for the for just for dog access or that sort of thing. I think we, what we can do is is, you know, direct people you know further to the west where it's a little bit more of a flatter slope to access the river. I think it's more of an access to Little River at that point. Um, but this area, just because of the, of the steepness of the slope and, and the location, um, we really don't want to, to allow that that type of access, and even on the east side, where it's the slope is a little different. I think it's again just not trying to. Um, we don't want to promote that, I guess, in a way. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I appreciate the comment, but and I know that it's hard to change, and and uh, I think what we'll probably end up having to do is put some sort of temporary fencing just to keep people away until 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 we solve that. Um, well, I, frankly, I think if you have an alternate access point, and I think I know probably where you're talking further west, I think that's yeah. a fantastic solution. And your suggestion to, you know, if you do put fencing, because we know people can breach that too, right? Yeah. Um, putting a sign indicating that alternate, I think that sounds about as good, especially if it's, as, you know, the slope, the grade there isn't nearly as steep. And so the erosive effects won't be as great i mean that sounds like a great solution to me yeah there's actually you you know you 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 walk by that area when you, if you use our parking area you actually walk by that right so it's um so you're right so i think maybe that's what we could do is just to do a little bit better with signage and, and identify that area as an access point to the river great um i did have one other question i'm just i'm leafing through my packet here and i just want to find it so i can speak to it with some Accuracy. Actually, if someone else has other questions while I'm finding what I'm looking for, feel free and I can chime back in. Um, I just want to speak to the signage aspect. Um, I have found it very helpful if you have a brief explanation of like help protect our, you know, our local 
you know, prevent erosion and, and help protect our local resources or something like that, then people will feel guilty if they don't follow the sign. So if you have a little explanation of like, you're doing your part by not using this, that might help keep people away from the area too. Instead of like, don't use it, use this area instead. If you get a little explanation, you can um, really encourage people to not use that area. Thank you. That's a great point. I've seen those signs before where they're identifying it's erosion, bank stabilization project, please respect, and, you know, things like that. So I think, yeah, definitely explaining we're not just closing it, but we're closing it for a reason. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, and the river is a drinking water source, so <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> Okay. Any other comments? I, I, if there aren't more comments, we can, we'll go over the conditional use uses and the, our, that were provided in the, the answers that were provided to our, um, the, in the application. Oh. Um, can I have one more minute? I'm <laughs> There yes. are so many pages in this packet. I'm having yes. trouble finding what I want, but I, I, I'm, cl I think I'm close. I know it's hard oh. because we got three sort of three applications in one there. Uh, um, so I'll help Allison out by asking a question. Thanks, <laughs> Al. Um, we and actually, uh, Mark, you and the uh, the team appeared before the Exo Squamscott River Local Advisory Committee a month ago for this project, I believe. A couple anyway, weeks. Yep. A couple weeks ago. If you, uh, so one of the questions I asked then, and, and I want to bring up now, is while they're doing stabilization work in the riprap, there's going to be equipment in the riverbed. Can you describe what that equipment is and, and, and what the precautions you are taking to make sure that, that, those, that, that those pieces of equipment don't damage the riverbed any further? Sure. So, so the, the, the work that's being done in the riverbed is being done within temporary cofferdams, which, which are dewatered. Um, and so the work should be done in the dry. Um, equipment would probably be things like bobcat, um, mini excavator, um, maybe even a, a, a small excavator that's a little bigger than a mini, but there's not much working room in there. And what they need to do is the, the, the bridge, you know, the arches come in low, right? As we saw in the photograph and they need to dig under those arches. So the only way to get under there is going to be with a, a small piece of equipment um, that's going to be able to do re reach under there and s scrape some material out and then place the riprap. Um, the, the drawings specifically um, follow the, the wetland regulations and they preclude um, maintenance, repairs, refueling of any of that equipment within the riverbed. All that has to be done outside the jurisdictional wetlands. Um, those are notes expressly on the drawings already. Um, and uh, other than that, the, the wetland regulations, you know, they anticipate that that equipment needs to work in the riverbed um, from time to time, um, but the the um, design is set up with the temporary coffer dams um, to keep them out of the water and uh, with the provisions to keep the, usually the concern with equipment in the river is potential for contaminants from spills or, or what have you. Um, so it's, it's handled in accordance with the regulations. Thank you, good question. All right, I found it. Can I go? <laughs> um, so on page 35, it wasn't even that far. There's a letter from Lou Curley saying that the wetlands delineation conducted in 2014 pre-dam removal is still appropriate. That letter was dated about two years ago. So I just um, was hoping to get a little more information about why um, you know, just to verify that that wetland delineation is still considered the best available or is still considered accurate and doesn't require an additional one. Yeah, so I think as, as Mark mentioned at the beginning, we, we tried to um, construct this project or, or move it towards construction in 2014, um, which was pre-dam uh, removal. Um, it was a little bit different form at the time, but a lot of the same basic components. Um, and uh, the, univer the uh, academy had uh, the wetlands delineated at the time uh, by Mr. Hurley. Um, once that project was delayed um, around 2018, 
um, we we brought it back up. Um, it, it took on its current form, and um, we had asked Mr. Hurley to uh, revisit his delineation because after that, the dam removal had occurred or, or prior to that time. Um, so he had come out at that time and uh, verified that the, the delineation was still the same. Um, and then we've we've moved forward with that as um, we've had some some minor delays since then in getting it to this point where where we are now. Um, so we don't we don't have a, a necessarily a reason to suspect that it's that it's changed. OK, so he did conduct a, a field survey in 2018 then to verify his his flags or his points. Um, that was that was my understanding from his letter. I would have to read the letter again, I guess, to to see what it says. But um, I don't know if Mark or Ron, yeah, you had okay. any more insight. With that perspective, as I'm rereading it, per your request, this letter is to verify that Gove Environmental Services, Inc. performed a site inspection to identify wetlands at the above reference location. Then he uses the standards. As you were aware, I delineated the same area in 2014. Okay, I had missed, I hadn't ca caught that. Yeah, Thank no worries. You for clarifying. Okay. I have one more. This is a comment to think ahead. Um, and this has to do with, I understand fully. So this is again, just a exercise for the future that this is a bridge repair project, not a replacement. Um, but I would just suggest with this structure and frankly, any of your river crossing structures on your property to be considering uh, the future climate projections in your design because you know as we look at the pictures of the bridge and it's like squeezing the river at the banks again I understand that's not the scope of this project but I would just suggest to our academy um, representatives with us today to be sure that you know you've got a lens towards that and we certainly have resources that we can we can provide you with uh, to help inform those decisions. Thank you, point taken. Thank you, Allison. Excellent. That's a good point. Uh, it's been an active stretch of river between the dam removal. Uh, it, yeah, it's it's an act. It's it's different than it used to be, and will continue to change. I'm sure as as it re equivalates to the to its new natural state certainly low right now um so yeah, we're I wish we could actually oops, do sorry, it right sorry. now yeah this would have been a good summer just yeah. like the drought of 2016 was a great year to remove the dam so <laughs> yeah, exactly uh that, that just to, just to follow up a little bit that was part of the uh kind of the blessing in disguise that the project had to be postponed in 2014 is that we asked steven associates to, to do more of the when the dam was taken out as far as the scour assessments that was that was that we had concern about when the dam was removed so that was part of the extra work that that ended up being able to do in incorporating this project um so the part of just to explain is that we did add that scope to the students associates uh, project is and that's part of the rip wrap that we weren't necessarily going to address before the dam was removed so now it's much more of an issue of the scour um with the velocity of the river going out but um but it's a good point it's, as far as what happens in the next 10 to 20 years you know and making sure that we're we're not being short-sighted so we do try to do that on our on our, on our campus in general so it's just a, it's a really good point okay i think unless there are other questions we could go through the the zoning ordinance um this article 934g2 um, and your responses to that, because that is really what we're deciding here in terms of the, the conditional use permit for this shoreland protection district. Is that right, Kristen? Murphy, do you have anything you want to add before we... No, I think that's the, the right approach. Um, they're seeking your recommendation to the state and then also recommendations to the planning board. Okay. Do we want to start with the local? Um, it's not how it's laid out in our packet, but I think it makes most sense to start with the conditional use permit and then 
um, once we can decide our own on that permit, then we could um, make recommendations on the state permits. Um, so the statute or the article reads, the planning board may grant a conditional use permit to those uses listed above which this qualifies uh, only after written finding of fact are made which have been reviewed by technical experts from the rockingham conservation district if required by the planning board at the cost of the developer provided that all of the following are true and then a the proposed use will not detrimentally affect the surface water quality of the adjacent river or otherwise result in unhealthful conditions the response was the project includes temporary sediment and erosion control BMPs to reduce sediment discharge to the Exeter River. The project includes permanent bank stabilization to reduce erosion and sediment transport into the river, mitigating previous erosion, which may enhance water quality. I don't know if there's any comments on detrimentally affecting surface water quality of the river related to this project. Um, it sounds like we've heard some of the BMPs in terms of equipment uh, in, the, in the river and dewatering will be managed. Obviously, I think this will be also managed I mean, what comes to mind is some sort of flooding event. If you had some sort of, you'll obviously have to be watching um, the weather. If there's some dramatic increase in, in the river level, that could cause problems for this type of project during the project. But you indicated you do it in the summer, which most likely would, would be a drier, lower flow time where you'd be successful. So I don't, I don't know if there's anything else to describe there. Or any other comments on A? I see no hand. Okay. Okay, B, the proposed use will discharge no wastewater on site other than normally discharged by domestic wastewater disposal systems and will not involve on site storage or disposal of hazardous or toxic wastes. The project does not include any wastewater discharges. Um, C is the proposed use will not result in undue damage to spawning grounds and other wildlife habitat. And the response was the, the project has been reviewed by the NHB and Fish and Game who have determined each, um, who have each determined no impacts to endangered and threatened species and habitats. Now that it's a little bit of a different answer to the question in terms of spawning grounds and other wildlife habitat. I don't see this impact uh, as it's rather small and limited. I don't see this as a real spawning ground, particularly at this time. <coughs> Of year, I don't know, Don. If you have any other comments, no, I, I just comment. Uh, I, and again, this is uh, uh, in, in favor of the project because two things. Two things uh, with the reduction of the control of the erosion, it's going to put you know, less sediment going to go in the river, and that's always a good thing. And the second, the second part of it is that this project has to be done at a certain time after the Al Wife run. So this will probably be late June, I think uh, we talked about, Mark. Mid June, late June. I mean, that's what our schedule is, anyways. Right. Um, or yeah. And that's managed by Fish and Game. So this is going to be beneficial to the spawning run of the alewives because we're going to have less sediment's going to go into the river because of erosion, and that's going to be a cleaner uh, area for them to run through because they're going to hopefully they're trying to go all the way upstream. So control of erosion and the sediments going in the river from the riverbanks is, is, a, is a plus. So I think that's a plus to the, to the spawning run of the, LY, the annual LY run. 
In addition, the, the river flow will be maintained during construction. So, you know, e even if there was something going on here during the construction period, the, the temporary coffer dams are not blocking the river. It's just, um, you know, along the bank. Right. Excellent. Yeah, I was, I guess I was considering if somehow the river was in a flood stage and overtopped the coffer dams or something like that, but that that's unlikely. Um, okay, why don't we keep moving? Uh, D, the proposed use complies with the use regulations identified in Article 934 of the Shoreline Protection District Ordinance and all other applicable sections of this article. Uh, as a repair to the existing bridge, the project does not propose a new lot or use, maintains vegetative buffer, does not increase impervious area within the shoreland, does not propose new or prohibited uses, and therefore meets Article 934. That's fairly straightforward. And the last one is that the design and construction of the proposed use will be consistent with the intent of the purposes set forth in this article, the Shoreline Protection District Authority and Purpose. And the answer is the project will repair the bridge and stabilize the nearby banks. Therefore, it maintains water quality, habitats, recreational aesthetic values and reduces shoreline impacts and therefore meets Article 931. So those are our conditional uses. Is there any other discussion on that from the commission or applicant? Okay, would anyone like to make a motion on this project for the conditional use permit? Sure, I'll make a motion that we have reviewed the application and have no objection to the approval of the conditional use permit as proposed. Uh, I'll second that. Thank you. Would you want to include the recommendation to have signage include the reason why the area is closed and the alternate access? Yeah. So can we amend the motion to include that recommendation that Kristen just shared? And the second accepts that? Oh, uh, yes, uh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, I think that that's a good motion. Uh, anyone else have any comments? Then I'll turn it over to our clerk for a roll call. Okay, Carlos? Aye. Trevor? Aye. Bill, you're recusing yourself, so we'll skip you. Dave Short? Yes. Allison? Yes. Dukoff? Yes. Sally votes yes. And Ginny? Yes. And Don, you would be voting as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Approved unanimously. Okay, we're not done though. So that was the first. Um, so then there's this uh, NHDES wetland uh, expedited permit application. And then also the shoreland permit application. How, how should we do this? Kristen Murphy, do you have any recommendations? Should we do it one by one? Um, yeah, I would do it one by one for clarity because one, your uh, and I, your packet did include some suggested motions. So um, for the state wetland expedited application, I suggested your options are we have reviewed this application and have no objection to signing to waive our right to intervene in the application as proposed. The alternate um, motion being we have reviewed this application and recommend that the wetland application um, be approved with conditions or denied as noted below. 
I'd be willing to go ahead and present the first motion that we reviewed this application and have no objection to signing to waive our right to intervene in the application as proposed. Second. Okay, so Sally seconded that. And unless there are comments, we can vote. Carlos? Yes. Trevor? Aye. Dave? Yes. Allison? Yes. Drew? Yes. Sally votes yes. Ginny? Yes. Don? Yes. Approved unanimously. Okay, and then the last one is the state shoreland permit. They're similar um, motions. We could have no objection or we could, unless there are any objections or additional conditions within the shoreland. Um, and that really, that's how these are different. The shoreland is more in terms of cutting of trees, which isn't really part of this. So uh, I, I, I would make a motion that we have reviewed the application and have no objection to the issuance of a shoreline permit for this application as proposed. I'll second that. Okay, any further comments? Otherwise, Sally? Carlos? Yes. Trevor? Aye. Dave? Yes. Allison? Yes. Drew? Yes. Sally votes yes. Ginny? Yes. And Don? Yes. Approved unanimously. Excellent. Wow. So I just have a question um, probably for the applicant. I know DES is allowing electronic signature. Is that your preferred way to receive this? Uh, yes, please. We will um, we'll follow up with you tomorrow, Kristen, if that's okay. And we can, um, I think we have a form that's been signed by the local advisory committee. Um, I don't know if I've provided that to you yet, but um, I, we will coordinate that tomorrow for, uh, for the signature of the commission. Sounds good. Okay, yeah, we can coordinate on that and get that back to you. Excellent. Um, and we will have to draft a memo to the planning board. Okay. All right, well that, I guess that wraps that up. Another exciting PEA project. We hope, yeah, thank you. So thank you everybody and appreciate the support. All right, thank you, Mark. And thank you, Jim. Thank you. All right, have a good night. You as well. Moving right along to item three. Do we need a stretch break? I'm sitting too much today, my back's hurting. Oh, okay, conceptual discussion. We actually have two more, two more uh, applications here tonight, but both are conceptual discussions and we don't have any actual they're, they're, act, they're items, but they're, there's no formal uh, application before us. So we don't need to decide anything on these, particularly although the applicants or potential applicants are looking to take our, our temperature on these projects and see, um, see what's going on. So we did uh, have a site meeting on one of them. We'll get to that one second. The first one, we have a conceptual discussion for the McFarland Ford parking area. Um, and I would ask that we have one of the projects, someone from the project is Wayne. Would you like to start or Jim Gove? Would you wanna to present to us this project? I, I think I'll let Jim go. Um... I'll call up the drawing for everybody uh, and I'll let Jim talk you guys through it. Okay, so uh, while Wayne is pulling that up, um, this is a parcel uh, that uh, is uh, 22 acres in size. 
Um, and it is currently not owned uh, by McFarland Ford. McFarland Ford is looking uh, potentially at a project here, uh, and it has some challenges. Um, so it's it, this parcel that we're looking at uh, is 22 acres in size. It has two, two major challenges. One is it's in a prime wetland or near a prime wetland uh, so that upland is upland areas that are left are clearly uh, encumbered by the prime wetland buffer. Uh, we also have a conservation easement uh, which is adjacent to this parcel, uh, which has part of the prime wetland on it. Now, um, this prime wetland um, originally, for some reason, uh, did not uh, show up uh, on the uh, database for the for the uh, DES, uh, and so. We brought it to the attention of everybody and DES has corrected it. So now this prime wetland is on their database. However, uh, based upon the regulations that are now in effect, the actual prime wetland boundary is the field verified edge of wetland. So, the area uh, does not quite match. Uh, if you see the green, that was the original delineation, I believe it was done by West Environmental based on aerial photos, uh, and that is the prime wetland area. What is actually out there for wetlands is in the blue. So the blue line that you see there is the actual wetland boundary. Uh, and you can also see that, uh, that that boundary is significantly different, at least as you move further into the middle of the parcel, um, uh, with regard to uh, what is wetland and what was shown as prime. Now, uh, the project that we're trying to see for work uh, is actually looking at an area right next to Holland Way. Uh, it's an area of upland, out of this 22 acres, it's an area of upland uh, that is uh, 1.78 acres. And, and so that is this area that you see we, we are, we're showing conceptually showing some parking on. Um, and Obviously, being right next to Holland Way, uh, it, it, uh, it's an area where uh, it would be conducive for them to uh, put some parking there. But really, as you look at this particular parcel and as a whole, and then in particular with regard to the setbacks uh, associated with um, a prime wetland, uh, you'll see that uh, there's really very little parking that can be done unless we could get some relief uh, from uh, that prime wetland boundary. The, uh, there would be uh, a couple of direct impacts. Uh, Wayne, can, you, can we go to the, over, the, the next one, the overall close-up? Yeah. So... Uh, so what you see there, we have actually two small direct wetland impacts. One would be to this, uh, uh, just to get access. Uh, and uh, because it's less than 50 feet wide, it's not considered to be a part of the prime. But that would be an access point of uh, 1,151 square feet. And then we have a small isolated wetland, uh, certainly not a vernal pool. Uh, very small area of, of, of 222 square feet. The real issue is not so much the direct wetland impact, it is the impact to the buffer itself. Now, one of the other interesting aspects about this is this, this has a town buffer. It does not have a state buffer. So in other words, this is one of the prime wetlands that does not have the 100-foot uh, 
prime wetland uh, setback that is administered by the state. So, uh, so we did, in fact, uh, end up having a, uh, a discussion, uh, a meeting with the state on this particular uh, idea. And basically they said, well, you know, you, you, you can show that you need the access to get to your uplands. And, you know, we really don't have any, any, any actual jurisdiction in the uplands. So, so I don't think we have so much an issue with the state Department of Environmental Services. The real issue here is whether or not we can get any relief uh, in the area uh, of buffer, because essentially uh, the buffer basically encompasses virtually all of this upland area, uh, and there's a really a very little left. And uh, the there is a demonstration of need. Uh, we we can show that McFarland Ford is 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 incredibly lacking in the amount of uh, parking that uh, Ford wants them to have. So there is, a, there is a real need for the parking, and these would be new vehicles, obviously. They would be the ones that, would, that, you'd, that you'd see out there along the side of the road. Um, but uh, again, um, can we in fact uh, have some way of being able to work uh, within within that buffer. So a couple of things just to kind of keep in mind on this. Um, first off, it is right next to the road. So if we are looking at uh, areas which would have lesser wildlife habitat, uh, lesser value, uh, it, is, it is that area of upland right along next to the road. Uh, Wayne, if we could go back to the overall concept, and the other thing is that basically is with this overall concept, you can see that we have uh, some other areas of upland uh, that are sort of scattered throughout this parcel, but, uh, and, and for all practical purposes, you know, they have the same issues. Uh, they are, they are, would be constricted at least by the prime well, though it's not clear, I don't think any, anyone has actually come to a conclusion as to whether or not the prime wetland in this, uh, in the in the remainder of uh, this site, whether it become expanded because of the fact that there's no clear distinction or wetland boundary there, um, but in any case, there is a potential there that I, we don't believe there is a whole lot of value to McFarland Ford to maintain it. So. You know, we could, in fact, uh, look to expanding the conservation easement, if it's of interest uh, to the commission, to include uh, the rest of the parcel. So, um, so right now, this is all in discussion. We're trying to figure out whether or not um, we should proceed. Uh, and, um, and so we'd like to um, have you folks uh, give us your thoughts. I'll jump in, Jim. Um, the problem I find is that here we are asking again, re moving into a buffer to a well to a prime wetland, and the next thing we're going to be asked, the next uh, item we're going to be taking up is, can we give relief to the buffers in another prime wetland? I just, you know, we hack away at these, hack away, and I just, uh, I'm a little apprehensive that. Uh, we're doing the right thing when we do that. Uh, this this is a fairly isolated piece. It's bounded by Holland Way and 101, and it does have wildlife in it. Uh, there's been a moose at times in there. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little uh, leery about saying, well, you know, let's let relief on this buffer, and then next the next uh, project we take up, well, let's give relief on that buffer. What do we have the buffers for? Um, yeah, well, you, you're, abs you're absolutely right uh, in terms of saying that uh, these old uh, nicks and so forth can certainly uh, uh, have a, an effect. The only reason why I think this one has 
uh, a little more value is twofold. First is that uh, it is uh, right next to the road itself. So and we know that Holland Way is pretty active. And so any wildlife would be pushed further back. But the other aspect of this too is that we could put the rest of this uh, all into conservation easement. Um, so there would be a gain uh, by the town uh, and it would be more than just the prime wetland as, the, as drawn. Uh, it would in fact be the entire parcel with the exception of the, uh, of the uh, uh, area of parking. So um, we are, it, it's not just uh, that, that the town and the environment wouldn't get something. Uh, there would be a, a trade-off. There's no question we're talking about a trade-off here. Um, but at, at least then we would actually be able to, um, you know, have an expanded conservation easement, uh, cover the entire parcel with the exception uh, of the, uh, of the uh, parking. So uh, there, is, there is a trade-off there. Uh, uh, no question about it, Bill. Um, but... You know, the, the question is, does the trade-off actually end up working for the town? Uh, because in, in essence, it would almost be an expansion of the remainder of the prime by putting the rest of this parcel into conservation easement. Uh, I have a question. So this also drains into the town water supply, am I right? Uh, it does get there, yeah. That's fairly close by. Uh, it's well, it goes, it drains across the street, and then um, if we had an aerial, basically you'd you'd see it eventually gets there, right? Is this? It takes a while, but it does get there, right? Okay, I'm trying to picture the drainage how it flows, because um, that would be also the other reason. It's not only prime wetland, but it's water source for the town currently is partially dependent on that flow. Yeah, can, can, I, can I try to get a better answer on that, Carlos, yes. on the drainage? Jim, are you saying that that drains directly across the street to the, the drainage area that's alongside Hannaford's parking lot? It does. It drains towards Sylvania? Yes, it does. And at that, that point, I think it enters below the Exeter Reservoir. Okay. I believe. You should have that information, though. I think you're right. I remember when we redid, or they redid the area next to the, what's now uh, uh, Hannaford. Sir. Yeah. Right. And that flows So all that drainage is going there? Goes into Wheelwright and then into the slump. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, it, it, yeah. But I mean, so the drainage isn't going eastbound. It's all yeah. southbound. And it doesn't go into the reservoir. Then that was my main thinking that it might drain it into that into reservoir right. directly. It eventually gets into the swamp spot. Yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. But none of it drains, drains east toward the, towards Dearborn Brook. Right. We'll it does not. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jim, can you, can I, I'm sorry, I'm asking another question. Can you, I can't read it well enough on the plans. How many parking spaces are we talking? Is there are a hundred, at least, it sounds, it looks like? Uh, actually, I can't ask. I'm going to ask Wayne to answer that. Yeah. yeah. 100, 136. Wow. And I assume it's all for uh, new vehicles or, or, uh, uh, previously owned vehicles for sale? It'd be for new vehicles. It'd be uh, commercial grade type of vehicles. That, that's where these would be parked. The ones for sale. Uh, it's on impervious surface. That whole area would be uh, nicely tied over. Correct. So it's 136 parking places that don't exist now Correct. for new vehicles? Correct. Oh, wow. Pretty yeah, big size lot. I struggle with that. That that this is that's a large impervious area for new vehicles. It just doesn't feel like 
It feels like there there has to be another another solution somewhere. There, what I'm curious, what other parcels or areas for parking have they've looked into? And 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 I, I understand that Ford wants them to have more parking, but I also I don't know. That doesn't sit. That that argument doesn't resonate yeah. with me that well. Right. I think I think one of the thing one of the one of the reasons why Ford has even considered this, or McFarland Ford even considered this, was simply because of proximity. I mean, obviously, it's best to be proximate. Proximate is that a word? Have proximity to uh, uh, the uh, dealership itself, rather than looking at remote uh, parking. And as you can tell by looking at, it, they're pretty well squeezed uh, what they have right there. So this was really the reason, and, and this, this uh, parcel um, had not been on the market for years and years, uh, and it came, well, it became available. Um, and so uh, this is why McFarland Ford wished to uh, at least uh, see, what, see what the Conservation Commission would say with regard to the possibility of doing this. I remember when they expanded back into that rectangular area up in the uh, north, uh, sort of the northeast part of their property. And we had discussions then about the proximity to the wetlands and, and the uh, Buffers. That was many years ago. This is Chris from McFarland Ford. Um, we, when Portsmouth Ave expanded, we lost quite a bit of parking, um, and as a result, and as a result of that, and then uh, Holland Way going in, we ended up going back into that area. Um, it's um, right. We've looked at a few other places to park. Um, the proximity is what is appealing to uh, to this parcel. Um, that we've found that that people, kind of in this age of Amazon and instant gratification, that uh, don't have a lot of patience to wait for us to go get a car. You know, ten minutes away, fifteen minutes away. Um, we've tried our other store in Northampton, leaving vehicles there. Um, it hasn't it hasn't gone over tremendously, I guess, um, which is uh, kind of what kind of why we started honing in on this something that was a little closer um, to the store. I, I do want to point out that we um, the actual parking that we're looking at here um, uh, is does retain a, uh, a 50 foot uh, buffer to the edge of the wetland. Um, and the other quite other aspect of this too is, and I don't, we haven't really talked about this with Chris, so I, I don't know if he is, has any interest at all, uh, but we have not looked at the potential. Also, we haven't dug any test pits, um, but we have not looked at the potential as to whether or not we could actually make this uh, pervious pavement. Um, and that's something that uh, potentially we could look into um, as a as a possibility as another mitigating measure for this. So, so, so one the, of the oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sal. The questions I would have would be, um, or the points I would make would be why this number of of parking spaces. What is, what's crucial about that? Because it is rather large, but also the question of what the material that, that would be used for the surface. And um, those would be concerns if, if we were to, to be inclined in this direction, those would be the things that I would want to ask. Mm -hmm. Agreed, yeah. No, thanks. The scope um, of this and the, could it be pervious? I think those are the two critical points. If we were to even consider it, I'd, I'd still, Allison, I cut you off. No, no problem, Drew. 
I, yeah, I think along those lines, I would want to have, I would want to see consideration of perhaps a trade off in, you know, number of parking spaces for, to, you know, li- decreasing parking spaces to increase buffer and trying to find maybe a number that sits better with everyone. I think you're probably hearing from all of us or many of us some discomfort with, um, you know, really maximizing that space for, for parking, which, you know, we recognize your need, but there's other needs to consider here. So to, trying to see some sort of um, reduction to increase the buffer. So I, if I'm hearing correctly, um, just, to, just to reiterate here, um, first off, the size is a real concern. And um, to look to the potential of reducing um, the amount. Uh, and then the second is the uh, thought that uh, if we could go with um, a pervious technology out there, that would be more beneficial uh, to um, the overall discussion. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. I have one other thought. Is that, is there a 50 foot structural setback from the paved portion of Holland way? Oh, I'm going to have to wait, have Wayne ask. So yeah. when we, we met with Dave Shopples, um, back a couple months ago and he, and he pointed to the zoning ordinance and said that there was no setback, um, and thought, so what he told us to do was to try to pull it within 10 feet of the property line in that area. Okay. Oh, that's the property line. So that's a 10 foot setback to property yeah. line. Okay. Yeah, that's our property line. So we're 10 feet off of that. They give us some green buffer and you it's right where that sidewalk ends at Holland way is where we're talking. Yeah, I was just looking and then there's there's another right of way there between the road and in the property, but yeah. obviously that couldn't be built on. Um, this one gives me heartburn. I'm not going to lie. I, I think especially because Holland Way is such an active road. Um, I mean, I, I think Jim's point was a good one in that, like that buffer may not be providing much in the way of wildlife value, you know, not as much as you would with, with an area that wasn't so active, but I think it just shows the point that when it comes to like the, the benefit of pollutant attenuation or anything like that, it's even more important and therefore replacing it with any kind of surface even you know a pervious one unless you're really putting in some 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 heavy duty bmps to take that out of that is going to just put that much more stress on the system in itself and going back to bill's first point i mean you know yeah nicks and cuts to all of these prime wetland buffers but in this case th- this is a pretty significant one in, in a in an area that's already pretty under siege from all angles so i think i'm i'm really having a hard time swallowing this one Hey. Uh, could I, uh, Andrew, can I ask Jim a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, my sentiments exactly uh, uh, echo what Trevor has, has said and what Bill has said. Uh, back to the potential of, potential if we, uh, this area went forward, a pervious surface there. And we know in New England, pervious road surface and New England winters don't always mix well. But this is a private parking area that's not, you know, it's 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 going to be maintained and managed by McFarland Ford. So, I, well, Jim, we, we throw around the concept of pervious surface a lot. What actual benefits to uh, the pervious surface give, especially to attenuation of pollutants, which is the primary reason for a buffer, which is to, you know, do that? Right. What you know, what what kind of pervious service are we talking about and what are the benefits uh, to attenuation that will, that, that it, that will, that will occur? So um, going back to uh, UNH Stormwater Center has done so much work on 
with, with pervious surfaces and in particular pervious pavement. Um, what they have found is that um, the layers that are underneath the pervious surface um, effectively remove uh, uh, virtually all the phosphorus, uh, all, almost all the nitrogen, um, and, uh, and actually tie up um, almost any of the pollutants that go into that surface. Now, uh, one thing it doesn't do, uh, it, it doesn't really do anything for salt, sodium chloride. Um, so that would have to be, you know, basically handled uh, in a different way on the surface. But again, remembering that this is, uh, as we say, not just a private parking lot, but it's a private lot where you're not going to have a lot of pedestrians or uh, public walking around in it. Um, that that, in fact, could be handled very effectively. It, it, is, it is one of the finest uh, BMPs that we have for stormwater management. Um, if we take a look at one of the first pervious pavement uh, jobs I got involved in, it's uh, over there uh, in front of the Lowe's uh, in Greenland, the Lowe's target. And... Uh, I actually was involved. I, I, I wasn't involved, but I was I was uh, privy to uh, because I, I was a wetland scientist on that. But Rob Rosine, who was at that time worked at the UNH Stormwater Center, actually set up a monitoring, um, and so it, it had the pervious pavement out there uh, that was then collected, and they monitored the discharge, and then it was supposed to go into there into a gravel wetland. And as he told me five years later, after five years of monitoring that site, uh, and this was not new cars, this was just your standard stuff that parks wherever or whatever out there in front of Lowe's. Uh, so you got trucks and you got big cars, and little cars and old cars, and new cars. Um, that basically, he said the gravel wetland wasn't even needed. Uh, when, when, the material, when, when the actual water was finally discharged from the pipes underneath the underneath the pervious pavement, he says it was so clean, he said you could drink it. So, so in, in a way, um, uh, it, it is one of the finest technologies we can use. You know, the, the, the problem that a lot of people don't like the pervious pavement is because of the maintenance. Um, they, if they have a public parking areas and things like that, they say, oh, you know, I don't want to have to vacuum sweep it at twice a year. You know, I don't want to have to do that stuff. Um, but, you know, this is a little different. Um, this, is a, this is a place which is going to have, you know, the new vehicles parked there. Um, and, you know, they can, they, can, they can put in the maintenance on this uh, that, you know, a public parking area might not might might not get, and and is not that going to be that difficult to do the actual maintenance you need for pervious pavement. So, um, so I guess to answer your question is, it it really does. It really is one of the best PMPs we have for stormwater management. Yeah, to to add to Jim's story, too, I've heard that same same story from Rob um, Rob Rosie, and he said, yeah, the water coming out of that was cleaner than the water was going into in the stream. Um, and also, when it comes to salt, you know, properly maintained, those those surfaces should actually require a lot less salt because the water should, you know, mm -hmm. go down into the ground. There shouldn't be any water to freeze up there in the first place. So. Um, I mean, proper maintenance is absolutely critical. So, I mean, it, it certainly, I don't know. <laughs> I think imp impervious surface, I would, I would have a really, really hard time with. I think there are some options out there, especially when we're talking about, you know, this, this, the size of it, going back to Allison's point too, in trying to balance some of the size with some of the buffer we could get back. Um, I think there's potential, but it's it's still a hard sell in my eyes. 
Would the pervious system change the scope of the drainage systems that are currently designed? Um, actually, it probably ought to add, well, I think they probably would, but, um, you know, Wayne, talk. Yeah. <laughs> See what you think. Well, if we went to a porous pavement, I mean, we would do a lot less cutting and those drainage systems that were shown would not be needed because you'd be using the porous pavement. So that, you know, the porous pavement would increase the, the buffers. And one thing that we can talk about with McFarland Ford is, is the possibility of double stacking some of the cars in this area, which would eliminate this drive lane and this other row here and more condense the parking, uh, more like a, a car dealership would show uh, multiple vehicles, maybe back to back and allow them to move forward. Um, and it might be able to increase the buffers quite a bit, so. I, I, I think we could do that. I, I do want to, I do want to hesitate though, to give the impression to the commission that we can get to the point where, um, you know, we can, we could actually be able with the exception of a, of a driveway, actually be able to maintain the 125 feet. Um, and uh, of course, maybe with this purpose payment, maybe we, well, I don't know. Anyway, I thought it was structural, but um, I, the, the thing is, I, I, I do want to hesitate. I hesitate to say that we could get it so we're totally out of the um, 125 foot structural. I don't think we can ever do that, okay? Um, I think we could make it uh, more compact. Uh, I think we can go with pervious. Um, and I think we could eliminate uh, the drainage systems there uh, so that they would remain in, uh, uh, in a vegetated state. Um, but, uh, you know, there will still be impacts inside that uh, 125. I, so, you know, to be honest, I just want to make sure everybody understands that. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, even if we talk about the things we're talking about now, cutting back on that top tier of parking is, or, and, and other parking, as Allison has suggested, can go pervious service, we're still impacting the the wetland buffer. And that's a, you know something that, as a commissioner, we have to think long and hard about. But thank you for being, you know, giving us <laughs> your, honest, your honest answer here. Yeah, and I'll also thank you for coming to us so early. I think this is a really helpful exercise to start, you know, the idea generation and trying to come to agreeable terms early before we're faced with a, you know, a wetlands permit application that we all find completely horrifying and have to figure out how to deal with. So I think this is a good approach. So thanks for being so proactive. So is it, so I guess what I'd like to ask now, is it worth us putting some of these things, implementing some of these things and coming back to have you take another look at it next month or do we do, or is this, or is this really a hot, such a hard pill to swallow that um, we need to be really honest with McFarland Ford? So, what, what, what's your thoughts on that? Or is it worth, is it worth some redesign or not? Um, I just had one other thing that I would throw in. I, you did point out the possibility of adding to the easement. Um, for me, I would need to see that area and see what condition it currently is in and how it might tie in with existing uh, protected area. Cool. Um, I think that would have value in terms of what's being proposed, potentially, depending on its, its current condition and function. Yep. Yeah, we can show that for yeah, sure. I'd be interested in that. Or is, is it is it so wet that is it actually buildable area? Um, if that was one question I had in terms of the easement. Um, is it, I mean, what are we actually getting 
right. from you so, from that property. I don't know because a lot of it does appear to be wetland. So it, it does, um, but of course the upland areas um, further. Uh, let's see, that would be to the east. Uh, they wouldn't have the same, quite the same restrictions on them as the as the prime wetland area. Um, the the uh, the aspect is that um, this was essentially a prime wetland that uh, I think was identified as prime uh, because there was a forested habitat, forested scrub shrub habitat. Um, and um, I think it also uh, has some benefit with regard to um, stormwater storage. Um, and, and it's been noted that there are, um, there is wildlife out there. I, I'm not, I don't, I don't necessarily think there's a lot of uh, wetland wildlife habitat. In other words, I don't, I don't think this, this is an area where we have a lot of vernal pools. We don't have a lot of open water. Um, we don't have um, a lot of marsh conditions. These, this is all, if you, if you take a look at it, it's, it's pretty forested. Um, so, so the what you what what would happen is that uh, essentially uh, this would be a place where you'd get um, a forested community um, that has a number of upland islands uh, through it, and that's and that's essentially what would be uh, in the easement. There's been very little uh, actual. Um, encroachment in the in in this area as far as like like for instance um uh the the existing owner has not done clear cutting the existing owner has not put in a whole bunch of trails throughout here um the existing owner has not really um you know done any clear cut logging or anything like that um so it's 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 still in pretty good shape Okay, well that helps. Thank you for that description. I still, um, I mean, I think it would be a benefit to expand the conservation easement, but also looks like a difficult, just it's an overall very difficult parcel to build on. Um, and I know we just seem to be encountering a lot of these marginal parcels that folks are trying to develop here and there and um, continues to be challenging. So it sounds like from what we've heard. I have another comment, Andrew, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, it would be helpful if we had a locust map, because I'm, you know, how far is this parcel away from where Dearborn Brook crosses Holland Way? And I'm curious about the parcel to the immediate east of that, um, what, the st okay. you know, what the status of that parcel is. Yeah, and where yeah, where is the water where is the water flowing a little more? Uh, well, yeah, that, where's Dearborn Brook Cross is falling away at some point. Yeah. Up east yeah, it's I, further well, further east, but yeah, I, I, I guess I'm looking for a locust map to get a better definition of the entire area. And that yeah. helps me with. I have the I have the Exeter. Good. If you want, uh, I could share my screen. I have um, the town GIS layer up on this parcel. Just showing off your computer skills. Yeah. Okay. Oh, hold on. I, I don't have that good computer skills, apparently. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. You see that? I can so see it. I don't know if this helps. Oops. There's the parcel. Is there any other, I mean, I can zoom around. Well, I'm looking for Dearborn Brook and I'm looking for what? Um, here's, is this the Dearborn Brook? I believe it is. And over here, and this is that DOT culvert, I think. That came up. There was another drainage right through here that came up when we discussed this right. this building project that's ongoing right now. Yeah, and so, right. yeah. So if you go to the north there, um, where the exit is for this parcel, this parcel 
is right next to McFarland Ford itself and then goes into that drainage uh, that's uh, right, goes past High Hannaford's right there. Right through mm-hmm. this little yeah. down here. Yep. Right down through there. That's, that's, where, that's, where the, that's where this parcel goes to. As you move... As you move uh, along, and then, and then, sorry, Jim, and then it somehow okay. connects underground through through here, yeah, yeah. and comes out wheelwright yeah. creek all the way so, past the golf course out to the um, Swamp Scott. Yeah. I think that should be confirmed because my understanding is the stop and or um, Hannaford restoration site outlets um, through a culvert from Osram to, mm-hmm. to yeah. um, kind of like the area where everyone would hang out for the right. fishing derby. Well, this is- No, the- it, it comes in just below, right. uh, just below uh, the dam at uh, the reservoir, I believe. There's a culvert there. You can see it when you drive in that dirt road. So I have the New Hampshire coastal viewer up with the streams layer. Oh, Allison's going to one-up me. I will one-up Drew and share my <laughs> Cool. <laughs> what, would That's, you like to okay. Do that? I'm going to stop. But it, the proxy, this is a good point. We, I mean, these details do matter. This, uh, I am concerned about this parking lot so close to the reservoir and the town's drinking water resources. So. Um, this even is if a- it doesn't directly feed into the reservoir. There it is. Can you see my screen? You can see the little stream that goes by. Yep. Yeah, right. And then here's what we're talking about here. Correct. Way back when we, when Hannaford's, well, it wasn't Hannaford's then, but when they redid that whole area, it was beautiful. And it's mm-hmm. now deteriorated terribly. Uh, I tried to get Hannaford just says, well, we didn't put it in, so we're not responsible. I talked to Dave Sharples about it. He said, well, we don't have money to fix it. And it's just, it it still drains, but it's in bad shape with a lot of uh, invasives. But it does drain, as Don was saying, comes in below the dam. I'm, st- I'm still interested in that parcel. <clears throat> the immediate east of the uh, mm-hmm. the, the uh, tonight's parcel. What the status of that is? What that you know? How many wetlands are on that property? I, I know I don't mean for Jim to go over there and do a wetland assessment, but you know. So going back to Jim's question. Um, what would the next steps be? And it seems to me we've expressed what our concerns are, and there are a number of them. Um, but but at this level, I think if you take this back to McFarland and say these are the concerns, is it possible for us to address any of them and come back conceptually next month? No, you know, there's no guarantee. But if there is a way to um, to address some of these concerns, we might take another look at it, but recognize that there are substantial concerns and maybe we can't do anything about all of them, but perhaps we can get to a point where, um, where we could make some progress. So I would say my own view would be, let's keep this at the conceptual level, take this information back and see what you can come up with. Okay. Would it be possible to have the information on impervious surface at that point mm-hmm. and whether pervious pavement is feasible? Yeah, I, I think I think uh, I think we uh, that's one of going to be the one of the major focuses we're going to take a look at when we talk with when we talk with McFarland about this. So um, uh, so yes, we will we will have that information uh, about whether or not it it's feasible, right? Okay, excellent. Well, this has been a good discussion. We've covered some some ground. Uh, anything else on this discussion? I just wanted to to, to, to um, echo what Allison had said about this is a really good place to talk to us as opposed to getting to a final proposal. So I appreciate that and um, appreciate your efforts in McFarland's in terms of talking to us early on in the process. 
Thank you. We appreciate we appreciate your input too. That's that's uh, it's helpful. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank yes. You. Thank you, everyone. This was a good, good discussion. Okay. I need to reorganize here. Um, so our next discussion is going to be talking about the um, a potential site plan at 32 Charter Street in Exeter, tax map lot 8236. Uh, it would be a conditional, similarly a conditional use permit for mm -hmm. a wetland, uh, prime wetland buffer impacts. Uh, we went to the site today where there was a site walk. Uh, five of us from the commission were there to review the site. Um, and I guess I'll turn it over to Jim or Christian, uh, whoever wants to lead this discussion and start us off. Uh, Jim, you want me to take the uh, the first intro piece? Yeah, why don't why don't you um, uh, uh, go ahead, um, and then I'll just sort of reiterate what uh, we saw out there on the uh, on the site walk. So sure, and we and we do have a photo exhibit that Jim put together um, for anybody that wasn't able to make it, uh, if that's of interest. But um, Mr. Chairman, can I share a, a screen of the concept? Please. We're, this is the most screen sharing we've done at any meeting, guys. This uh, is, we're really we, getting good at this. Uh, who, who's talking here? Who's speaking for the applicant? Uh, I'm sorry. It's Christian Smith, uh, engineer with Beals Associates. Thank you, uh, Christian. Yeah. Should take just a second. Are you guys seeing that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So... <clears throat> This site is in is in uh, pretty tough shape from the perspective of there is a lot of junk strewn throughout it. And uh, from what I'm told, I have not been on the site yet, uh, actually into the prime wetland itself, which we can demonstrate what, what the existing condition is uh, with, with the photo evidence from Jim. So what the, what the developer is looking at here is a very similar situation, basically cleaning up all of the 50 foot buffer as well as the area of the prime wetland that has been impacted by the uh, the storage of refuse, and and by that I don't mean household garbage. It's it's building materials and things from the shop and and things of that nature. So what the contemplation that he had us take a look at initially, and this is very conceptual. Uh, the land surveyor went out, shot some existing monuments, uh, took the boundary from a, a record plan, as far as I'm aware, and. Uh, then actually physically picked up Jim's wetland flag. So the wetlands are real. The boundary is, is not necessarily perfect, but it, it is probably very close. And the contemplation would be uh, four plexes, three of those, so 12 units total uh, in, a, in a townhouse sort of organization with basically a 18 foot wide private drive coming in off the end of Charter Street. So you can see here, we've got the 50 foot uh, buffer, the 100 foot wetland setback, and then the 125 foot buffer. Uh, it's, it's quite evident that, you know, if, if there's not some relief given, this project is, is dead before it ever gets out of the gate. And, you know, again, we would, we would just like input from you folks uh, as to whether or not, you know, cleaning up this existing site situation and, and allowing for, uh, or, supporting a conditional use permit to reduce the uh, the buffer out here to 50 feet would would you know be deemed uh, appropriate and and would you folks support it so with that I can turn it over to Jim uh, if you have any additional things to add um, yeah if you would if you could actually put up the um, uh, the, full the photographs I think I think that would be helpful especially for folks who haven't had an opportunity to see it. Um, sure. And Jim, maybe describe this where this is. I don't know that we've gotten. I think we zoomed in pretty close yeah, to the parcel, it, and we need we need we might want to zoom out a little bit first. Right. Oh, you want to go back to that, Mr. Chairman? 
Well, I don't know if you have an area map or I could show. The... Uh, we, we don't have an area map uh, prepared. Okay. At this point. I, I, I could, if, if people want, I can zoom over there. Or Allison can zoom on her. I do have it up on the coast. Shoreland. Well, just, just to just to put it in words, if you go Charter Charter Street comes off of Front Street, and this is at the very end of Charter Street. And looking right. across the wetlands, you can see the back of West Side Drive. So right. it's a it's an area that if you didn't know it was there, you would never experience it, so to speak. Um, right. So but it's, it's always good to have the locust map because yeah. You know, the people watching would want to know, you know, this is where it is. I have, a, I actually have it up on the Exeter. Oh, you got it, Drew? Yeah. <laughs> I think. Can you see? Is that working? Yes, it is. Yep. yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's the parcel highlighted in yellow. Um, this, this is Front Street that zooms around here, Route 111. This is Charter Street that comes down past an existing multifamily development. And then it comes actually down a little hill and around into this parcel. Right. And this is a, the prime wetland layer as shown, which is a gym redelineated from what I understand. Right. You can talk about that. Right. But there is seemingly a little stream that runs through here and under the railroad runs and connects into the little river right here. Right. And then it keeps flowing down under Linden Street. Yep. So it is part of this greater uh, Little River watershed. Right. Um, and there's an aerial that actually is somewhat telling. If I could turn off that other layer. <clears throat> of the extent of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the extent of the stuff is right. I don't think it'll let me zoom in anymore, but that's, right. this is all the stuff and the wetland is it's right up to the wetland and over it in some cases. But I'll stop presenting and Jim, you yeah. And so, Christian, I think the, I think next would be great to show the photos, if you would. So, this the the, the train track uh, is actually to the left, and so what we're doing is we're looking uh, into the prime wetland, uh, and this would be on the east side of the parcel. Um, the 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 wetland uh, is actually uh, in the forefront of this photo. So that shed, the debris, et cetera, is all in. If we can go down to the next one. Uh, uh, so, so here, um, this is what, if I, I just turned, so now, we're looking at both the prime wetlands and we're looking at the buffer associated with it. Um, and you know, this, this is not just the only area. This continues along the length of the prime wetland as we move from east to west. Uh, if we go to the next one, uh, Christian. Okay, so, so again, I'm, I'm literally looking into the prime wetland. And this is the kind of uh, uh, amount of material. My wetland flag is right behind that large tree. Um, and then this is just debris that is, I don't know how long it took to put it in there, but it, it, it is significant. Um, can I go to the next one? Yeah, so, so, we, so literally, we don't have just uh, uh, impact uh, uh, in the buffer, we have impact in the prime. And I think you can start to uh, realize that we have what I think could be a real win-win 
for the environment and for the town, uh, as well as allowing the uh, developer to um, you know, be able to build what, what, what is economically viable to build. And we can get this cleaned up. And, and uh, we'll, we will probably need uh, a Welland permit uh, to actually be able to remove the stuff because, um, let's face it, once we get it out of there, we probably ought to do some replanting and everything else. But, you know, this is something which I think could be a really um, uh, great cleanup. Uh, as well as um, allowing uh, the developer to to uh, uh, get in some houses there to help support this. If I could go down again a little bit, Christian, I think there's another one there. Yeah. So, one or two. Yeah. So we basically, again, uh, the, the, we have all of these all of these things like like behind there. We have we have you know tires in the wetland that have been dumped there uh we got these sheds that are kind of half built in the wetland half left on the wetland uh we have this area in front that is kind of this kind of this uh, uh gravelly rubble uh that is is there um if you can continue on down a little bit more christian i mean this is this is a classic it's got this i don't know what it was but it it's, it's almost looks like some kind of dock that they built out into there were just, just uh, the stream is too small to fish, I think. But anyway, they, I don't know. Anyway, they were out there. So this is, this is an indication of what we have. So the, the difficulty is that we have this uh, and we have a, a, what I consider to be a, a thoroughly degraded site. Um, you know, even if it wasn't a prime wetland, it would be worth uh, certainly um, going in there, cleaning this up, uh, and then also uh, cleaning up the buffer as well. Um, so I, I think that, it, it, again, from my perspective, it could be a real win-win for everyone here to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, get the debris out of the wetland, uh, restore uh, 50 feet of the buffer, um, and then allow them to uh, build some houses here. Um, and, uh, and that would all, uh, I think, would balance out pretty nicely. So um, I'll be glad to answer any questions. And maybe we want to put up that uh, 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 design again, Christian. Sure. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions. If you don't mind, Andrew, go for it. Uh, this particular <clears throat> this particular lot looks like there's been a lot of illegal dumping or illegal debris thrown on that lot for a long time. Uh, I'd be curious that you know why why we you know this was allowed. Two, what's the access to that area now? Is it Charter Street or is there another access off of Front Street? How, how do people get in there to, to illegally dump stuff? Charter. The, the charter is the only access. Yeah, I, the, say, I don't think it's people. Pe I don't really know how the. I, I was on the sidewalk. I don't. I can't go to an explanation for how it got to the condition right. that it's in, which is bad. Um, but my understanding is that the it, it wasn't random people coming and dumping. That that was not what happened. Right. So um, was it, it was a previous owner. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, there was a machine. There was a mechanic. He's a mechanic, a machine shop, and so a lot of it is parts and supplies and various things. So my my first thought is we didn't do very good enforcement of our own uh, zoning, our own uh, uh, rules and regulations over on this lot, did we? Just a passing comment. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, to, to not, I, I, I don't think. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not blame, I'm not blaming. Oh, no, no, no. Or, 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 or I, no I, it, I'm just, I'm just making no. a comment that, you know, right. this, this particular area should never have gotten into this state, number one. It, it's, a, it's a hidden spot, though, Don. Uh, I mean, to, to be honest, oh, with you, honest with you, there's a, there's a real uh, elevation difference between the a, a lot adjacent to it that has the other houses and this i think i think at one time that this might have been an old pit 
uh, because you know it made sense that'd be an outwash area right next to the right next to that wetland and stream. So it was an old pit. I think it was dug down um, and it's kind of flattened out right there next to the train track. And and it is hidden. It's not unless unless you, unless you had like a drone that was flying over all the time to find out what stuff going on. I, I don't. I, I it's, it's it would be tough for a code enforcement to figure out anything that's going on back there, I think. I mean, that's just that's just my belief that I think it was hidden enough. Um, had a gate, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, was, was locked. Um, so, so it's that kind of thing, you know? Um, yeah, the other question, uh, isn't there a private, uh, Buxton have a well in there somewhere up at Chatham Street? They do, yes. Where is that in relation to this map? Again, I'm looking for the locus map again. Uh, it's, well, it's on their facility. You want me to stop sharing, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that okay. it's relevant. That's, that's fine. It's not a, it's their own. Yeah, yeah, it is relevant well. because I'm talking, usually we have a well protection area and I want to make sure that a private well is protected it's radius is as well is as protected as a uh, public well. That's all. Yeah. So I was just curious to where the well location was because it's a substantial well. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's it's not a pub town's drinking water supply. It's their own private source. I understand, but again, just curious. Again, to the I'm looking at. I always want to look at the bigger picture of where a project's going is is uh, being undertaken. Um. I mean, I can share this if you want to look at where it is. Well, let me stop. Well, it's the same question I asked of the previous, you know, uh, project about, you know, give me a locus map of where we are. Yeah. I would, I would look for the same year uh, for this particular project if we were to move forward. So I, I would I would just uh, comment on, on the basis of the site walk that I um, – that the the site is in very bad shape, and the the, the prime wet wetland as well as the buffer are are, are um, in very bad shape, and and anything that could be done to clean that up, I think, would be advantageous. The question for us, as a conservation commission, is um, what would then be the impact of this development on the uh, renovated prime wetland and buffer and that's that's something that we're going to have to come to terms with but i don't think there's any question that this is prime wetland that needs to be cleaned up in one fashion or another it's really very in very bad shape and i'm sure there's um various pollutants and degradation of the water and so on and so forth it's just uh as Don said, this is a situation that got out of control for whatever reason. And uh, it, it, it could be a win-win. It just depends on what the impact then would be of the building of the project on this renovated wetland. So that's, yeah, that, I, that's yeah. the question we need to come to terms with. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a great question. So Agreed, I Sally. also would like to know about the flood attenuation, flood storage. Uh, you know, you could put a lot of impervious surface. Well, how has it impacted drainage, uh, the flood, uh, the flood storage? Because you've got West Side Drive, which is uh, you know could be prone to increased flooding, uh, including drainage problems. Uh, so I, I think we need to look at that as well as the prime wetland as to the impact on the abutting properties. Because I, you know, uh, with the little stream going in, is that stream impacted by more more water flowing in from impervious surface and structures that. Uh, create a, a potential, uh, you know, more water being in that prime wetland, which backs right up to that one side of West Side Drive uh, houses. So these yeah, are if I may, Don, when, if we were to get to that point of actual hard design, you know, we would be compelled to make sure that there is no more water coming off this property than there is in the current situation. That that would, would without question, be a requirement of the uh, any planning board approval. There's no more water in terms of impervious surfaces? Uh, well, what it boils down to is we would have to mitigate any increase that we saw in the peak flows for the required storms, you know, based on uh, 
Section 9 of the uh, Site Plan and Subdivision Regulations, which details uh, what you have to do. They, they've almost mirrored the alteration of terrain criteria in, the, in that section of the ordinance now. Um, so basically, we would have to analyze, here's the existing situation, and we would have to prove that by some level of mitigation, whatever that may be, we were not adding more peak flow to any of those given storms, the two, the 10, and the, two, and the 50 year events. So just, just to add to the description of the, of the properties, the current state, there is some portion of it that is currently paved. So in addition to the, um, right. to the stuff that's there, it's also, there's also some, some, some pavement that yes, is in the and a few outbuildings, which obviously the roof runoff would be from impervious surface as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a fair amount of pavement, actually, the driveway that's yep. within, I think it's actually closer right now than, closer to the wetland than mm -hmm. where your design, where I believe the the actual access point is further. That's to, correct. To the north. Yep. Whereas the current, you can see the current driveway right here is, is within probably the 50 foot buffer. Yep. Or close to it. So that but that might need yeah. so in doing this project uh, there, there's a significant amount of material that would need to be removed from right. this buffer essentially the whole buffer would need to be cleared and right. revegetated yep. uh, we did observe some invasive species there was a little bit of knotweed uh, i think we may have seen some other Invasive. Most of the upland is 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 uh, a lawn. If it, if there's not something on it, it's it's grassed. There are some trees. Um, I don't know, Carlos. Did you have any thoughts on the on the invasives? Uh, the main one that um, it's past flowerings. It wasn't that evident. It was purple loosestrife. Um, but I was actually once you get into. Um, the area of the well and it's not doesn't have buildings on it um, there's actually pretty good diversity of um, cattails and uh, winterberry and just very quickly glancing at it it was not as bad as I thought it might be based on the condition around it um, yeah, the, core, the core wetland is, in, is actually in quite good shape uh, yeah. it's more the perimeter of the wetland yeah is in the buffer is is where the the issues are but where it is actually saturated wet wetland um and it was today there was some standing water there um seemed to be intact for the most part yeah the most the worst part is the invasive stuff that he has left there i mean all the junk the axles and car parts and whatever um this is, is, is uh, uh, Sally said, this is a real tough one because you really need to clean that up somehow. Looks like Ginny has her hand up. Ginny? Is, this, is there a realtor sign at the top of this property? Yes. Okay. Does Wouldn't the owner have to clean this up before... It, a title would be transferred? I don't believe so. I, I think that the, the developer who's looking at this uh, would take that on uh, and ensure that it's done right. But as, other than this particular developer... If right. In other words, if, if, if you folks don't think this is a good idea and he walks away, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure how you know, how you go about enforcing getting that, uh, that mitigated. Yeah, I, I think, I think the person who, who lived there and may have been, uh, the person who collected all this material, uh, has passed away. And that's why this particular lot has, uh, come up for sale. I think it's, um, the, uh, uh I think it's the son who's, who's selling it. Um, and uh, so 
um, basically uh, the developer who was looking at it, we're working for them, uh, is said, look, he said, I'm, I'm willing to take this on. Uh, as long as I can get enough houses to support it, um, I'm, I'm, willing, I'm willing to take this on and clean this up and, and make, it, make it right. So maybe we should go back to the site. I can stop sharing. We could go back to the plan. I guess this always comes down to the, when we have a lot of these discussions, we always, it always, to me, a lot, a lot of these projects feel like, and, and understandably so in this case, there's, there's a lot of capital cost to this cleanup that they're always trying to fit as much as possible into a small space. Um, and, and this, this feels no different. Uh, it does feel like a lot of houses in a relatively small lot. How many acres is the lot in total? It's only two, two acres, I think. Yeah. So it's two, two acres, acres. And we're talking 12 houses. Mm hmm in roughly one acre because it's only really half the lot if that correct right the uh -huh. good news it is served by water and sewer so there won't be a new septic system going in or anything of that nature okay must be some yeah which is another expense that that would be on the developers uh it's going to require a a obviously a, a pretty significant pump station uh, for sewer yes. collection and pumping to the uh, town system. Okay. It seems like uh, just looking at this plan to me, what strikes me is the number of uh, the amount of pavement relative to the number of homes, uh, the way it's laid out it, the, you're losing a lot of space to driveways. Um, I don't know, could the same number of units be developed in a different type of layout, whether it's uh, apartments or uh, I'm, I'm sure it or a single could, parking lot or something, the way it's, it's laid out. I don't know if anyone else feels that way. Yeah, and I think what we've, what we've got here is an 18 foot wide access drive because that's really probably as, as minimal as, as you would want to go for, you know, two-way traffic with, with this number of homes. Uh, the, the contemplation of this preliminary concept uh, would be for drive under garages in each of these. And uh, so that's, that's, you know, how you end up with, with the pavement that is, that is shown there. And, and again, this is very, very conceptual. Yeah. You know, we, we would certainly work with you folks and obviously the planning department and planning board um, to find something that was uh, equitable and, and reasonable that everybody could get on board with. We don't typically decide the number of ha units. Right. Is there a yield plan? Kristen Murphy, can you, I don't know if you want to chime in on anything here related to planning department's process on this and oh. is this uh, a zoning is this would this be allow allowable density given the zoning and size and all that um i don't know i would defer to doug on what the density is but it's r5 zoning district which is a multifamily district um and so i don't know i think the minimum lot size is um pretty sm relatively small for multifamily compared to um you know your standard <clears throat> residential district i think it's like i don't know uh, five five is pretty dense yeah yeah because yeah, there is so that I'm dense mr there. chairman i think it's five thousand square feet feet per unit excuse me but five thousand square feet that, but I, of of land per one unit per per dwelling unit okay and so this would be, and I know the lot next to it there, lot 30 has similar high density on it. Right. And it's just uphill. <clears throat> so there's a fairly steep hill in between those two lots. 
<clears throat> some of the things the planning board will consider is <clears throat> they'll, they'll talk about is <clears throat> the amount of units uh, and <clears throat> potential green space or recreation space for the residents. Is there enough of that? Is it, you know, <clears throat> is it too dense to preclude that? So these are all planning board issues, uh, among others. Um, it'll go through a pretty strict, uh, stringent, uh, uh, you know, a review, uh, a technical review committee. Uh, it'll talk about, you know, can a fire engine get in there? Is there enough turnaround radius? All those things are part of the planning board process. Um, and if it gets to that point, we'll, we'll have a, an opportunity to, to weigh in through with the uh, with the you know, conditional use permits, but you know, from just strictly from a conservation standpoint, I'm having more difficulty with this this one than I am with the previous plan <laughs> for for many many reasons. Uh, one is that the Little River area has been really degraded over many many years. Uh, the water quality there is much less than it we, we would like it to be. So there's been a lot of degradation of the Little River area. Uh, as it moves its way uh, down toward uh, toward Linden Street and, and uh, over to Court, Court Street and then eventually into the Exeter River. So I, I get concerned about that we, you know, not have, by putting more structures in there, are we, you know, are we potentially uh, doing more harm to that, to that, uh, to that area and to that prime wetland area. So, uh, you know, those are some of the questions I have. I have questions about potential flooding and drainage, which I know, as Kristen has said, is all going to be part of the planning board process. I understand that, but um, this has been an area that has been that has been suffering for a long time, uh, up and down through that stretch. I just have a lot of concerns, and this isn't going to really help it much. But or it's going to help it, but. That's just my thoughts off the top of my head. I did not do. I did not participate in the site walk. I did do a Google search, but it wasn't as as telling as the pictures were. So thank you for that uh, for taking those uh, those pictures. Yeah, I guess for me, I I see kind of the opposite because I see this as a potential. I see the value of that cleanup. Um, and that it might actually improve significantly some of the Little River, as opposed to other ones along the Little River that have involved going from an already forested um, scenario to having um, housing put in and, and impervious surface added to them. Um, this, the surface is already not great. Um, this there, like it's, it is like the bottom of a, of a gravel pit or something at, uh, all the way into the, the wetland area. So anything that would improve that, I think, is a benefit. My, I guess, question would be to put in that many houses, is that if legally it would be required anyway to clean it up, regardless, then obviously not having that density of houses incorporated right along that um, wetland and impacting the buffer of it would be better than then and as long as it gets cleaned up but i'm not sure that that's going to happen in in another way i don't know what the procedure would be to make sure it does get cleaned up yeah i'm i would be it's going to be hard to clean up because there's structures there's a lot of out, small outbuildings or medium to large size outbuildings within the buffer that would it's not just picking up stuff and throwing it in a dumpster. Um, it's yeah, I lean a little bit towards Carlos's view. Uh, yeah. Because if something like a development developer coming in, it, it wouldn't get a single family house or something like that. Just wouldn't wouldn't work. Um, it's not, and and I think that it. Um, if it was left to the current owner and he or she didn't do anything with it, the town takes it like they did the house on uh, Garrison Lane, take it for uh, uh, tax back taxes. Town would have a huge expense to clean in that area up. Uh, so I, I'm leaning a little bit towards some sort of 
compromise between uh, building and cleaning. And like Carlos mentioned, I think one of the differences for me from this, from the <clears throat> previous project too, was that essentially this is a redevelopment as well, right? Where, I mean, we're not, we're not cutting into virgin forest here, you know, and a well-functioning buffer zone where we're working within a buffer zone that's already compromised. So we're trying to see if there's a way to sort of meet halfway where we may, might be able to restore some of that that function, some of that quality while, you know, allowing for development that's honestly already present. And I wasn't on the site walk, so I can't, you know, speak to what, how detrimental that current development is. But I mean, just from looking at, you know, some satellite views, it's, it's there. So that's certainly the difference in my mind. Actually, Kristen, I think your pictures did it better than it is. it is. Some of those pictures with the sun on it didn't look so bad, but it is terrible. If you go yeah, I can't take credit for the pictures. Those were Jim's. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy has her hand up. I Jimmy. would also just say that um, on the positive side, although this is not a Conservation Commission um, um, item per se, but because housing is limited in Exeter, it's, uh, I like developments that increase the housing. So um, it is a, a weighing of the, of the uh, conservation, the natural resource impact of this um, project compared to what it is now and what it would eventually be. And I think those are important um, considerations for us and for the planning board. Agreed. Well yeah, well said, Sally. Ginny, do you have a comment? No. Okay. Um, so it sounds like we're willing to work with this potential owner. And from what I understand, you know, this developer hasn't finalized the purchase or the acquisition of this Correct. parcel. Correct. Yeah. Um, but is this design that's being shared right now something we would entertain or should it be modified? I, I mean, I think I would, I, I think there could be, obviously there needs to be some more work done on it and um, to minimize any potential impervious surface and to, to shrink it as, as, as small as it can be, but uh, I don't know that we need to get into the details of that any further tonight. Yeah, Drew, I would echo that, that, you know, the potential developer just do the best they can to, you know, minimize impact by potentially reducing den density, you know, do that cost benefit of, of benefit nature benefits versus, you know, the return on investment, you know, so fiddling with that to see if there's any way to reduce the density here, because it's pretty, pretty intensive. But I agree with the other comments. I like the redevelopment aspect, you know, not our purview, but personally, I like the, you know, providing additional housing in town, which is, is difficult, like Sally suggested. And um, so I think, you know, it's it's tricky, but anyway, just a suggestion to try and reduce density if possible. Or, we'll certainly convey that to the developer. Yeah. Looks like Ginny has her hand up. Ginny. Do you have a question, Ginny? You're still muted, sorry. You've got 12 units with possibly four people, four person to a unit, 48 people living in a acre, on an acre. There's no green space there. I, I don't know what would be, is allowed by the town. 
Well, I would highly doubt there's going to be four people in every one of these units based on, first all right. of all, the size of the buildings and, and the townhouse configuration. It just doesn't lend itself to that. But um, <clears throat> my guess would likely be two to three bedrooms on these. Uh, you know, again, we're, we're so early in this process. We really wanted to talk to you before doing much at all, aside from this very conceptual layout, um, simply because you know, th there are decisions that have to be made uh, if, if this developer is going to choose to, to move forward and, and execute the purchase and sales agreement uh, that he's, he's got the, uh, the project tied up or the lot tied up in right now. I, I, yeah, I, think, um, I think the key element for us was the fact that uh, all the, all the, all the uh, intent uh, for the commission to work with us uh, on this and and not hold the stringent uh, 125 foot setback because um, the key element for us is as far as being able to move forward uh, and do the restoration uh, and restore a portion of the buffer uh, is whether or not um, the commissioner would work with us on the concept of uh, not holding the 125 foot as a stringent setback. Uh, I think what I heard, and I, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I think what I heard was there was an interest by the commission to work with us um, and not hold the stringent 125 foot setback. There are a number of elements that we need to look at, including stormwater storage, a potential for flooding, um, you know, how the restoration will take place, the, how, we, how we're going to uh, look at the restoration, the functional value of the restoration, um, and a few other things I jotted down. And, uh, but um, my sense is that, that I think I heard uh, that the commission is willing to not hold us to a stringent 125 foot setback. Mm -hmm. Comments on the 125. I don't think we got into a specific number uh, in either of these discussions in terms of what's an acceptable buffer and what's not. So this is conceptual. So I guess I don't want to feel like the commission has to decide anything right now. Um, oh, absolutely not. No, we, yeah, when it does come before us, it'll be a different commission. Um, you know, people leave, new people come. We might have a different feeling. So uh, it, it does seem like, you know, there's got to be some there's already at such an impacted site that having a 50 foot buffer would be an improvement um, for this site. So I, but that also could we, could we do better than what the site plan is? I, I would like to. Uh, I don't know if others have other comments. In, in the interest of time, too, I'd really like to echo what, what Jim was saying. In, in this case, this is such a conceptual level that really we're talking about, would we entertain the, the plan of building within this buffer? Because if we are like, you know what, this prime wetland is really, really valuable to us. We don't want anyone stomping around in the, in the buffer zone. Then like they mentioned in the very beginning, this project is dead on arrival. So there's no point in a buyer buying it and, and even bringing a new plan to us. If we are like, no, we are absolutely not going beyond a hundred feet because like even a hundred feet buffer, you will not get any houses on this plot. So again, going back to Jim's point and because it's very conceptual and very late, we, we just have to say, like, are, yeah. are we willing to entertain something that's, that's well within the 120 feet buffer? We probably get 50 out of it there. And like this plan shows, you could probably have a pretty well defined 50 foot buffer 
but like anywhere from 50 to 120 feet, there's going to be development in it. And are we willing as a commission to entertain that idea in however, however long it takes them to put it together? Again, my, my thought is yes, because it's a redevelopment, because hopefully it'll improve the quality that's already currently there. And because the amount of, um, you know, so again, stormwater runoff would have to be mitigated and the amount of pervious surface is probably pretty darn close that you're probably not getting any worse. And there, it sets up the ability to have a win-win like we're talking about. I agree with you, Trevor. Well said. I agree. We're not making a commitment, but we're open to that for the discussion yeah, of course i think i think that's uh, that's and that's really what we wanted to get from this conceptual discussion so thank you i i that's 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 terrific thank you all right thank you guys all right thank you very much for having us tonight and uh hopefully we'll be back all right all right good luck well thanks a lot for the input too Yes, definitely appreciate it. Yeah, really, pre really appreciate this opportunity to have a, a, a good discussion like this. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Thanks a lot. You as well. Take care. Have a good night, folks. Okay. Whew. Now we need a stretch break. Um, well, it's 930. We have a few more things, but I think we need to do a few more things before we can adjourn. Um, Kristen Murphy has a an expense request that we should discuss for a few minutes. Um, well, I just I just want to. We're getting toward the end of the year. Um, and I wanted to double check about end of year expenses as we go into the budget season. It's always good to show that we are using the funds that have been allocated in the current year before we start asking for next year. Um, uh, when I initially kind of panicked about this, there was um, two, two kind of larger expenses that hadn't posted. So I feel a little better um, than I did before. But I am looking, I guess, from Carlos to know, was an additional weed wrench something that was would be helpful? Because it does appear that we have funds under Conservation Land Administration for that. And I know um, in a lot of the volunteer projects, you're requesting to borrow funds, I'm sorry, borrow equipment from Nature Group, which isn't always available to us, especially during the pandemic. Uh, I would say uh, yes, I think invasives are going to continue to be an issue. Um, it is nice that there are some options for larger groups to get borrowed equipment, uh, but having it on hand would allow a lot more flexibility. And I would say like a weed wrench and a pick. Um, I happen to have pick, picked up one <laughs> that uh, has really works well. It's narrow bladed. Um, and I found that that combined with the weed wrench really allows me to do pretty much everything of course a lot of it's just pulling straight out pulling but um, they work really well together and a set of and the pick i use is my own um so it's, it'd be good to maybe have one pick or two picks and one more weed wrench um probably the same size um would be quite useful yeah, I was I was really impressed with how how effective that weed wrench was when I went out with you. That that really, and you're right. I mean, with with the pick, you're really pulling out whatever you want with those. So, so then um, I guess I'm looking for your support in approving. I would say so. A weed wrench is two fifty, and then maybe an additional fifty for the other tools. So up to three hundred dollars for some tools um, from Conservation Land Administration. I'd make a motion to do that. You're up to 300, you said? Yes. Second. Um, oh, sorry. Vote. We should have a vote on that. Are we ready? 
Carlos? Yeah. Uh, aye. Trevor? Aye. Bill? Yep. Dave? Yes. yes. Allison? Yes. Drew? Yes. Sally votes yes. And Ginny? Yes. Approved. Um, and then the other thing that we noticed um, was the Rains kiosk. The metal portion of the sign could use replacement. Um, it was $100 to purchase, including shipping. So I would look for your support for extending $100 for replacing that kiosk. So moved. Second. You ready for a vote? Carlos? Yes. Trevor? Aye. Bill? Yes. Dave? Yes. Allison? Yay. Drew? Yes. Sally votes yes. And Ginny? Yes. Approved. And then, Dave, I'll defer to you on amount. Um, I know you were including the re weed wrench in your um, in your comment, but I know some supply wood supplies and materials would be helpful for trail repairs. So um, would let's see, would two hundred be sufficient for that? I think so. We've had a great response from a lot of the trail users as far as uh, materials, tools, labor, all that sort of thing. Um, so the work that's been getting done out there, there's really been not a lot of cost involved, but yeah, a little, a little buffer fund like that would be helpful. So up to 200? Sure. So moved. Second. Ready for a vote? Carlos? Uh, aye. Trevor? Aye. Bill? Yes. Dave? Yes. Allison? Yes. Drew? Yes. Sally votes yes. And Ginny? Yes. Oops. And then the last item, there's four, about $400 remaining in outreach. Obviously, we haven't been able to have events this year. Um, there, there is talk of a solstice program, and last year we spent under $100 for that solstice event, a winter solstice celebration out at Rains. So I, was ta I, I need to look into the logistics for transferring the funds from outreach, but I was talking to Jeff Beck because on the east side of Rains Barn, there's quite a significant deterioration in the siding there. Um, and there may be an opportunity to do some of the siding work if we could buy the materials with that. So um, so the request for this would be to, um, to transfer funds from outreach to um, I think conservation land administration would still still make sense because that would apply for rains maintenance um, for the purchase of materials to repair the siding on that east side of the barn. So and that so, would be three hundred. Yeah, uh, three up to three hundred. I thought it was four hundred. Yeah, so that would retain. I think it, uh, that would retain a hundred dollars. Oh, hundred for the got it. And uh, maybe we'd have something else, but I'm not sure. Or we could do I'll, up I'll, to four hundred. I'll motion to for three hundred for the uh, maintenance of Rain's Barn. Second, second that. Yeah. Ready for a vote, Carlos? Hi. Trevor. Hi. Bill. Yes. Dave. Yes. Allison. Yes. Drew. Yes. Sally votes yes, and Ginny. Yes. Okay, approved. That's all I had for expense requests. Okay. Um, in terms of the committee reports, I you may have seen it's on page four of the packet. Uh, Kristen pulled together a summary sheet of various events and things that are going on related to the different committees. So I don't know if people... I think the idea was maybe instead of just going reading through the list, people could, um, well, people rather than saying the whole list, people could just read it. 
Uh, there may be some benefit to viewers to, to go through certain items. It's also sort of a tracking thing for Kristen. Um, do you want to go through any of these, Kristen? I'll defer to the board. If, if there are some items that you'd like me to elaborate on, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I, I would just like to um, point out that we did end up canceling the Skywatch at Reigns. Unfortunately, it was, um, we got to the point where because of uh, the continuing questions about COVID, we thought um, uh, using an abundance of caution, it would be better to postpone it. We really want to do this. And we've had to postpone it in the past, but it looks like it's going to rain on, on Thursday. I mean, on Friday anyway. So uh, in any case, we had to postpone it uh, and we, we will do it again in the future. I, I would like to just take a moment to highlight the other outreach event that happened last week was the, the climate forum. And just to highlight, I was really impressed with yeah, it was good. the level of effort and professionalism that went into it, specifically with Kristen, Allison, um, Trevor, Trevor. and Amanda. The, right. And, and, and other folks. With Don was involved. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing other people, but... Um, it was it was a, a really nice event, and I learned some things and got to interact with some people on the other boards. So it was um, very successful. Thank thank you guys for doing that. Ditto. It was great. I'm glad it seemed like it was well received. I've had a lot of positive comments about it, and a lot of excitement to seek ways to roll it out to a broader audience. So. Um, so I think that's worth future discussion. Um, the other outreach event that um, Nick was involved with, we had partnered, if you remember, with Parks and Rec for an after school trail, kids trail program. And Nick led two walks. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about those, Nick. Sure, yeah, um, we did a couple. Um, we did Jolly Rand and uh, what was the first one that we did, Kristen? Pistachic Wildlife. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, we had two great groups of kids. Um, the first week we had about six or seven, and then the following week it was like double that. So, um, great participation, um, a lot of eager um, outdoor enthusiasts. Um, they really like playing trivia, so I would ask them random questions about stone walls or barbed wire or types of trees. Um, and it was really neat. Um, kids were really into it. Um, it was super engaging. And both times that I was able to go, the weather was awesome. So um, it was super successful. And um, I'm looking forward to doing it, doing it again. That's great. That's a great outreach. How old were the kids, Nick, basically? Um, it ranged, I would say, for the most part, between fourth grade and seventh grade. Um, yeah. Very good. Excellent. Oh, yeah, awesome nice. job. Yeah. That, that it can be a great age. It's also a tough age. So you really do have it. I'm impressed the way you could, if you could keep them engaged with all your trivia. That's cool. <laughs> seventh graders, man, they start getting too cool for school. <laughs> <laughs> And then I guess the other thing to point out, we did receive, so Word Barn, um, Ben Anderson, Ben and Sarah's um, site that we had on earlier today, they hosted an event that was a wildlife education program. And they, um, they donated $80 to the conservation fund for the benefit of Rains Farm, um, which is a portion of the proceeds for that event. And they have another event coming up, I think on the 17th. Um, Halloween. Uh, so it's going to be another wildlife um, education program with, on a little spookier note. So I might have the date wrong, but it is on the Word Barnes Facebook site. Um, and I'll try to share it on the Conservation Commission's um, site as well. Excellent. Yeah, please do. That's, that's great. So thank you to the Andersons for that and more great events.
over there. Um, trails, do we want to discuss anything? We're going to discuss next month the issue of e-bike or electric powered mountain bikes on our trail use. Um, but there was a report of potentially that occurring in the town forest. Um, but we'll wait till next week. We're going to follow or next month. We'll follow up more about that next time. I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about that, Kristen. I think it's good to have a have time for a more robust discussion about it. Okay. What's the update on the pollinator pathways? I couldn't hear you. Pollinator pathways? Sorry. Yeah, the poll pollinator pathways. What's the update on that? So um, we had talked about having a seed exchange. And so um, we started to collect seeds, but logistically, I, I just didn't have time to dedicate it. Jenny really didn't either. Um, we do have, we do participate in the pollinator, pa pollinator pathways program. And so regionally they are tracking homes and businesses and town properties that are dedicated to improving uh, a portion of their, their property for pollinators. Um, and so there is a call out to residents and businesses if they want to have their property on the map, they can contact me. Um, so far, we do have the Morissette property as well as the White Perry Meadow listed. Um, they are both Monarch Way stations as well. Um, they have a seed exchange. Jenny, maybe you can help me out with the date. Maybe that's the thing that's on the 17th. Um, coming up and I will be sure again to share that on the Conservation Commission's Facebook page. So it's, um, you know, just getting together and sharing pollinator plant seeds. So I think the word barn program is the 26th, it's uh -huh. the Thursday, and then I'm going to go over to Kingston on Saturday. But I did scatter my seeds the day before the rain, whatever day. So we'll see how it how it works. Um, I just cut the heads off and and scattered them around the pond down on White's Meadow. So we'll see what takes place. Great. And then Sally had brought up the concept of a pollinator garden out at Rains. Sally, Ginny, and I were out there and we kind of looked at the area behind the kiosk. It seems like a good potential site. So we do have some seeds that we could use for that area. Um, and then as far as the pollinator plantings that were done at the Morissette property, we did have decent success. The plants were incredibly tiny um, and had a lot to compete with the, with the field. Um, but we left quite a bit of the pins in because only one third of the field was being mowed. And so we'll be able to go back and look, take another look next year and see, maybe get a better sense of what the success was. We did have several species of plants um, the penstemon, I think, in particular, that saw evidence of flower and fruit. So that was exciting. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? In Anyone else wants to report? Um, Why don't we approve the minutes? I think I think we're all say like expired from today. Uh, are there any edits to the minutes that anyone has? Oops. I didn't really read for content since I wasn't at the meeting, but I did notice that Allison's name was misspelled. <laughs> so that needs to be corrected. Good catch. I read through it and I didn't notice that, but I did, it did seem he did a good job summarizing the conversation. So I'm okay with it. Shall we take a vote on that? I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes. I'll second that. And we'll vote on that. Carlos? Aye. Trevor? Aye. Bill? Yes. Dave? Uh, I was not at the meeting. Allison? Yes. Drew? 
Yes. Sally abstained. She wasn't at the meeting. And Jenny. Yes. Okay. Passed. All right. Excellent. Do we have any other business or correspondence to discuss tonight? I don't, I don't think I don't so. Think I think so. We can wait. Um, all right. Well, our next meeting is scheduled for November 10th. Get out and vote before that. Yeah, post-election. <laughs> Hard to believe. Yeah. Our deadline is Friday, October 30th. Halloween is on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. It may be a full moon, so get ready. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope everyone has an excellent rest of their evening. Thank you guys so much. Thanks to anyone who's still watching. Otherwise, oh. I'll motion. Whoop, Kristen. One thing I was supposed to bring up. So they are seeking volunteers for Household Hazardous Waste Day. Um, that's October 17th um, from 11 to 1. So in your email, you have the contact. I sent it late this evening um, for how to sign up for that. I think they're pretty shorthanded this year. Okay, that's always a big and important event at DPW where people drive up with all sorts of fun stuff. <laughs> so that's great. Thank you. Hopefully someone can do that. There does seem to be a hand raised. Oh, Ginny, I don't think no. you mean to have a hand. Okay. Um, any last going once, going twice? Uh, I motion that we adjourn. Do we have Second. to vote? I'm forgetting. Well, okay. let's do it. No. Let's vote. No. Car no. 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 <laughs> okay. I, <Vote>. Regardless. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're adjourned. I just am used to voting. I feel yeah. like we voted a lot. No, great, great meeting. Thanks yeah, so. thanks a lot, Drew. All right, yeah. thanks, Good. guys. Yeah, Good night. Care. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night everybody. Good night.